attention of guests. The Honorable Premier. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> and uh, welcome back to my colleagues for another day of important debate in the, in the legislature, those who joined us in the public gallery and those who are joining us at home. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to begin my remarks by offering congratulations to Kateri Code, who was recently named as the new Executive Director of the Mi'kmaq Confederacy of Prince Edward Island, a place where I used to work. I know Kateri very well. She's a proud member of the Abigail First Nation. Uh, she's a passionate and caring voice who's worked hard to develop many social programs uh, for First Nations and others in Prince Edward Island. She'll be a great leader and a great asset to that uh, very important organization. So congratulations to Kateri. I also want to say uh, congratulations and thanks to <clears throat> the Minister of Social Development and Housing, uh, MP Sean Casey and uh, Shelley Mazika from the Canadian Mental Health Association for uh, participating today uh, in the official opening of, uh, of a 28-unit uh, complex on Fitzroy Street. It's an amazing uh, facility that went up uh, quickly, and I encourage the Minister to do more and more of these as quickly as we can in Prince Edward Island. Uh, as well, there was an announcement of, uh, of five homes in Abigail First Nation as well, Mr. Speaker. So just thanks to all involved for uh, working hard to, uh, to get these projects uh, up and running. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's an important day, and then hopefully we'll continue doing this uh, at an even faster pace in the days ahead. Uh, Mr. Speaker, tonight uh, we'll expect the results to be announced of the PEI school board elections. <clears throat> um, I want to thank all of those who put their name forward and all of those who voted. I, I sent my ballot in by mail uh, earlier, or at the end of last week, I guess, and uh, uh, in my area there were eight or nine good candidates on there, so it was good to see, Mr. Speaker, and I just uh, wish the best of luck to all those who will be successful tonight, but all those who have participated, uh, thank you very much. And, and just finally, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, as we all know, is November 11th, and we recognize Remembrance Day, uh, which is uh, a most important day for us to, uh, to remember those who have fought for us uh, and those who continue to protect us, Mr. Speaker. I'll be participating in events in Hunter River, uh, in Wheatley River tomorrow, and uh, it's always an important day. <clears throat> I had uh, three uncles who served in the Second World War. I know I've said this before, Mr. Speaker, but I think it uh, bears repeating because uh, they are, like many, are the heroes that even though they have left us, we should remember their names and their contribution. Uh, uh, my uncle Lloyd King uh, was a member of the Royal Winnipeg Rifle Battalion and was one of the first uh, groups of Canadians to land at Juneau Beach on, uh, on, uh, on D-Day, Mr. Speaker, in 1944. <coughs> uh, my uncle Jack King <coughs> was a member of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. Uh, he was part of the second wave at, uh, at Juneau Beach, Mr. Speaker. And my uncle uh, Charlie McConnell was part of the Royal, Winnipe or the, sorry, the, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry Battalion, Mr. Speaker. And among other things that he never ever wanted to talk about was he was part of a group of, uh, uh, and a battalion that uh, liberated a concentration camp uh, in Germany, Mr. Speaker, at the, end of, at the uh, final days of the war, so of World War II. So just to all of those who have given so much to us, uh, may we remember them, all of those who continue to protect us and protect freedom across the world, uh, we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude and our thanks. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to echo the Premier's closing remarks there. and also draw attention to the fact that we're privileged to have a veteran with us today, Bill Toussaint, who is the past president of the Royal Canadian Legion Branch Number 1 here in Charlottetown, um, is with us today uh, with a fine array of medals. And uh, thank you, Bill, for your service to our country and also for joining us here today in the gallery. Uh, the, this fall, the Island Nature Trust announced the donation of a fairly large piece of land in District 17, New Haven Rocky Point, that was donated by Dr. Rosemary Henderson. It was almost 30 acres, and the Trust will continue to lease the land to a local farmer, which is currently what's done with it. Um, there'll be a rotation of perennial crops in there and grasslands, and the farmer has been participating in the ALICE program for some time. And they, one of the things they do on this land is they will delay cutting the hay until 
after the birds uh, in the field have fledged. And that's particularly the bobolink, because uh, the bobolink back in 2017 were designated as a threatened species here in Canada under the Species at Risk Act. And so I want to thank Rosemary for her, her donation and thank the Island Nature Trust and the farmer who uses that land for doing it and treating it uh, as carefully and well as they are. And this morning on CBC Radio, many of us may have heard Chris Ortenberger from Bonshaw, and she was speaking on behalf of the Citizens Alliance, and they're holding an event uh, on Sunday afternoon this weekend. Um, and she spoke so beautifully about the loss of trees, both in her own area in Bonshaw, but also across the whole island here. And this event will be an opportunity for people to get together. It's, it's a two-part event. The first bit will be outdoors at 2 o'clock. And that's at St. Peter's Road um, in uh, Churchill on the Trans-Canada Highway. And then around 2.45, I think, or 3 o'clock, folks will move to the Bonshaw Hall, where there'll be some music from Todd McLean. And um, there will be words spoken. Gary Schneider is going to be there, Yvette Doucette, the poet, and many others, I'm sure, to talk about the loss that we're all feeling. And I'm looking forward to participating in that, that event on Sunday. And again, to to come full circle, the Remembrance Day services are happening tomorrow across the province. And uh, I, too, am, uh, will be privileged to attend a number of events, Kelly's Cross early in the morning, and then Crapo, where the, the main Legion service will be held this year. And then uh, in Charlottetown in the afternoon at the Garden Home. And it's always a privilege, very moving. And uh, we will remember them and thank those who gave their lives and who continue to offer service for our country and for our society and keep us free and well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's a great pleasure to rise and, and say hello to, uh, to Bill, who's in the gallery. I look forward to saying a few words about you later. And thank you for your service. Um, I was, also want to say, um, in, in here, there's there's uh, a lot of staff that make make uh, make this place really happen. And I want to say, uh, in our building, uh, we have two veterans, uh, Barry and Trevor, in here. So I want to say a special thank you to their service to them. So, as discussed, tomorrow is Remembrance Day, a day when we honor all Canadians who have served and continue to serve our country during times of war, conflict, and peace. We mark this day by showing our respect these brave men and women who make up the world, make the world a safer place. We forever owe them gratitude for fighting to uphold the values of freedom and peace we hold dear as Canadians. King George VI said in a dedication at the National War Memorial in 1939 in Ottawa, without freedom there can be no ensuring peace and without peace no enduring freedom. Mr. Speaker, these are important words. So I want to encourage all Islanders to get out and show their respects. Uh, tomorrow, the Charlottetown Remembrance Day Parade will start at the Charlottetown Legion Branch Number 1 at 10.30 in the morning. The parade will travel down Ponnell Street, turn right on Kent Street, and then again on to, to Great George Street, where we'll stop at the Cenotaph in front of Province House. After the ceremony, everyone is welcome to enjoy entertainment at the Legion Branch. Mr. Speaker, I hope everyone in our communities will join in the parade or other events commemorating Remembrance Day or observe two minutes of silence wherever you may be at, a, at the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, and I, once again, thank you for all those veterans who have fought for us and our country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's actually the first time rising this session. I want to welcome everybody in District 19 that's watching and, and uh, all of the folks out there uh, in my district. Uh, I appreciate all the support they've given me. Uh, I think some of the stories we've heard over the last couple of days about veterans and the importance of uh, tomorrow was significant. Thank you, Bill. Um, I actually see one of the medals you're wearing is one that I've received, and uh, I'm glad to see you're displaying your medals. Um, this evening, I'm going to have the privilege of, um, of, uh, of meeting with the Div Commander for 5 Div and also the, the Commanding Officer and, and Executive Officer from HMC of Charlottetown, and we'll be some, uh, spend some time with them. and and uh, have some conversations over uh, the important role that our Canadian forces uh, give to our, our, our province. And I will hope as many people go to Remembrance Day services tomorrow. But to change full circle here, Mr. Speaker, uh, 4618, 56.6 north, and 6348, 36.2 west. And I want to recognize Tom Sherry and uh, Jim McFarland and Beth and Paul White from up in Sea Cow Head area. Um, 
Finally, after a number of years, DFO has divested the Sea Cow Head Lighthouse to the, uh, the Friends of Sea Cow Head Lighthouse in, uh, in, in Sea Cow Head. This lighthouse was actually uh, constructed back in 1864 and it was moved in 1917 and it stands an astonishing 89 feet and it has uh, provided the light to, uh, to that area for uh, in over 10, 12 nautical miles. And uh, in 1959, actually DFO turned it finally into automation and it was automated and it actually was in parts of Road Avonlea. And I just want to congratulate uh, this group for taking initiative to take over this lighthouse and make sure it's preserved and I wish them all the best going forward with this, uh, this historic piece. Thank you. Mermaid Stratford, opposition, hosting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and hello to everybody from Mermaid Stratford watching today. And I especially want to say hi to, again, those, um, the residents of Andrews of Stratford. I had the opportunity to go um, early this week and join them in their service for Remembrance Day, and I had a, an opportunity to talk to several um, of the residents. And it's, um, you know, it's interesting talking to them. Several of them really had only moved into the residents days before the shutdowns, before COVID. And so they were pretty, uh, it's, there were some impactful stories and allowing them to now gather again um, is just brought tears to many of their eyes. So I'm glad that we're able to gather. And um, I also had a chance to talk to three residents who are veterans. And um, one of them, we were talking about the display at the town of Stratford. And if you've ever gone to the town of Stratford uh, leading up to Remembrance Day, they have all the banners of veterans that, that served um, from Stratford on banners um, lining the hallways and the lobby area outside of the town of Stratford office. That's a powerful walk to take and to go and, um, you know, see those full height banners. But w I shared a video of walking through those with one of the veterans and the emotion that he had just, you know, to be able to see that because he hasn't been there in person. And, and certainly now he'd like to go and, and see that in person. But last year, um, Town of Stratford unveiled the honor roll, which recognizes 10 um, Stratford sol residents, soldiers who died, paid the ultimate sacrifice. They died in combat or as a result of their injuries. And that was part of the, um, unve the, the new cenotaph, which is now completely accessible. You, you used to have to walk through grass, so veterans couldn't actually get to the cenotaph before. But now it's fully wheelchair accessible. And all lining it, you can see those who gave the ultimate sacrifice and the tributes to them. It really is beautiful, and I, I really suggest to all the residents of Stratford and surrounding area to join tomorrow in the uh, the gathering and the, the service tomorrow in uh, town of Stratford. It uh, really is nice to gather again and to be able to um, give the respect that veterans deserve um, on this day. Thank you, and every day. Summerside, Wilma. Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all of my colleagues back and say hello to everyone watching at home in Summerside, Wilmot. I just wanted to bring attention to a really special event that Time Valley Sherbrooke and I had the opportunity to attend last night. It was hosted by Culture Summerside and it was called A Symbol of Courage. It was an, e an evening excuse me, of music and drama that commemorated the um, 100th anniversary of the Prince County Soldiers Memorial in Summerside and it was really quite a remarkable event. We were pleased to get to join the uh, Lieutenant Governor at the event. So I just wanted to shout out Culture Summerside. They always put on an incredible show, Mr. Speaker, if you ever have the opportunity to see it. And additionally, Mr. Speaker, the Three Oaks Craft Fair is back in Summerside in person this year. It's been years since this has been able to happen and residents are pretty excited. So we will be out shopping for interesting local things and I would encourage everyone else to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown. Winslow and government with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Say hello to everyone in District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. Um, I do kind of want to echo the uh, sentiments and remarks of my colleagues. Um, it was great this morning to take in the first in-person assembly at West Royalty Elementary in almost two years. Uh, my son, Harrison, I'm very proud of, was part of his uh, grade three classes all through school. I did a Remembrance Day presentation for the parents as well, so it was great to see that. And of course, uh, while I'm uh, standing up, I always find Remembrance Day so special to me, and I owe that to my late grandfather, Cecil Bell, 
He was very proud of a lot of things, but I think the thing that he was most proud of was the fact that he was a veteran and he fought for our freedom as a tail gunner in the Second World War. And he, uh, he has passed that on to me, Mr. Speaker, and I continue to try to pass that on to the further generation. So I just want to uh, say thank you to Bill, who's in the, uh, in the uh, gallery today, and to all veterans, and of course, lest we forget. Thank you. Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it is a pleasure to rise here in the legislature uh, this afternoon. Uh, I want to say hi, hello to all of uh, the great people up in District 26, Albert and Bloomfield, that may be uh, joining or uh, looking in on the proceedings this afternoon, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this week, November 6th to 12th, is Medical Radiation Technologist Week. Radiation technologist, medicine technologist, radiation therapist, all of these do incredible work, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly want to thank these dedicated health care workers for their great work serving Islanders. And just in closing as well, Mr. Speaker, I too want to pay tribute uh, to our veterans, uh, thank them for their service to our country, to our planet, to our earth and also uh, to thank uh, those uh, who continue to serve, thank them for their service. And uh, like other ones that have stood here this, uh, this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, I too have had uh, three uncles who served in the Second World War, uh, two of them in the Army, one in the Air Force. Uh, my uncle in the Air Force was also a tail gunner, Mr. Speaker. And, I, uh, we collectively owe these ones so much for the freedoms that we enjoy today. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome everyone to the House again today. Uh, welcome joining us in the gallery. Uh, welcome to everyone watching from Belfast, Mary River, and I just wanted to uh, stand and recognize Rem Remembrance Day as well. Uh, in District 4, there will be five services, uh, Belfast, Iona, well, Iona, then Belfast, then Murray River, Murray Harbor, and Uick. And each one of them is special and different, and I enjoy every year attending as many as I can. Two of them conflict now, so I'll have to make my mind up pretty soon as to which one I'm going to. But I... Um, uh, Remembrance Day brings back a lot of memories for me. Mr. Speaker, I used to play in the Belfast Pipe Band. I was a piper, and we would spend every Remembrance Day starting very early in the morning, piping at all the services and uh, finishing around supper time. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of times it would be snowing, and it, it was a really good remember reminder of what um, all our veterans have gone through, uh, the struggles and, the, and uh, the sacrifices they made. And I just want to thank all our veterans um, I think back to the ones that attended the cenotaph uh, in Belfast back when I was a teenager and how they're all gone now and mm -hmm. what uh, a huge uh, void it is in our life to not have them here. But I would just want to, uh, again, uh, lest we forget. Did I miss anyone? No? <clears throat> well, anytime we have a veteran in the gallery, anytime I get a chance to speak to a veteran, uh, I take the opportunity. If it's uh, 100 pages long, or if it's two words long, just to say a thank you to our veterans, uh, I take that opportunity anytime I, I get it. There's two groups of people I like talking to, about, with, is veterans and their students, or children on, on uh, PEI. And, and, and Bill, I'm gonna have a little conversation with the Premier after I get out of my chair, and I go upstairs, and hopefully the Premier and I can have a great conversation, and uh, you'll be uh, very glad if uh, things go my way. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, I can, uh, hopefully I can make things happen here for uh, veterans on uh, Prince Edward Island, because uh, I have family uh, that uh, served in World War uh, II, uh, Merchant Marine, and. Uh, and it's a, it's a topic that is dear to my heart, is uh, the veterans here, not only in Prince Edward Island, but right across uh, Canada for what they did for our country and the freedom they gave us. Thank you, Bill. No pressure, Premier, but... I don't think we need the meeting, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I better give you a heads up. 
Ah, uh, statements by members. The Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, Time Valley Sherbrooke and I had the opportunity to uh, make a gift to Lights for Light in support of the PCH Foundation on behalf of all the Summerside MLAs, Mr. Speaker. Since 1995, Lights for Life has been an important part of the island community. It's been a key fundraiser for the Prince County Hospital Foundation, and it's a chance to remember and honor your loved ones during the holiday season. During November, the PCH Foundation accepts donations in memory and in honor of loved ones, and those dedications are gathered into a keepsake book, excuse me, that is available during December in the PCH. The fundraiser culminates in a nightly choreographed music and light show running through December at the Prince County Hospital. Bring your family, tune in on the radio, and enjoy the show from the PCH parking lot in the warmth of your car. The shows run nightly at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., and 8 p.m., beginning on December 2nd and going all the way through to December 31st. All gifts to Light for Life um, support the purchase of much needed medical equipment for patients at the Prince County Hospital. This year, the PCH Foundation has been working to raise nearly $2.4 million to fund things like three new ultrasound machines, patient beds, and much more. Donations made before November 19th are included in the annual Light for Life dedication book. Gifts can be made at pchcare.com, at the Foundation office, or in the hospital lobby, or by calling 902-432-2547. As they say at the PCH Foundation, Mr. Speaker, even a little light can mean a lot. Thank you. The Honorable Member from Morrell, Dona, Government House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak about the community of St. Peter's in the District 7, uh, Morrell, Dona. Recently, they held a neighborly fall fun event at the St. Peter's Community Complex. It was a great chance for residents to gather for an afternoon of entertainment with lots of fun for people of all ages. There were many new people to the community who were able to attend. their meet and greet. They could share stories with neighbours, old and new. We hear a lot about folks from uh, these days, Mr. Speaker, but I don't know who my neighbours are anymore. There's lots of new people coming in. So this was a perfect example of the community that took a great initiative to welcome those into the community and also to catch up with lots of others that we haven't seen in a while, Mr. Speaker. There's food and drink and musical entertainment by Sharon Winters McDonald and Krista Young. The community was hit hard during the hurricane, like many others, Mr. Speaker, and their warming centre was alive and well with so many volunteers. <coughs> After the hurricane, Mr. Speaker, the community put out a call uh, for a community cleanup. The turnout was amazing to mm -hmm. help out with the yeah. Dr. Roddy Centre and the parks and all the community buildings. The equipment and machinery were all volunteered and there were so many turned out to haul debris away. Lunch, of course, was provided, Mr. Speaker. It was a true community turnout. The community is on the upswing, of course, with the new UPEI Climate Change Centre. Uh, the new, a new business is starting up and, of course, the Greenwich National Park just up the road. The villages like St. Peter's are the backbone of our province, Mr. Speaker. The people and relationships that build up in a small community are special, and they build that sense of community that PEI is proud of. It's a truly caring community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. This week we honour all veterans, and especially our Ireland's veterans who serve to protect Canada and Canadians and to maintain international peace and stability. Black Indigenous people have a long history of serving in our military that can be traced back years before Confederation, providing their many unique skills in the forces. William Toussaint is one of our black veterans, and I am honoured to be speaking about him today, and is seated in our gallery. William served in the Army and Reserve Forces from 1966 to 1989, uh, a 23-year distinguished career. He served as a vehicle technician and refrigeration mechanic system technician. His career saw him posted all around the world to Germany, Egypt, Sinai Desert, Cairo, Israel, and in Western and Eastern Canada. In 1996, he was posted to CFB Summerside as a senior non-commissioned officer and was in charge of refrigeration shop until 1989. After leaving the military, he continued to serve his community as a Shriner, Freemason, and with the Royal Canadian Legion. He was president of the Island Shriners Club and the president of the Charlottetown branch of the Royal Canadian Legion. He has fundraised for children's hospitals in Montreal, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Hillsborough Hospital, Camp Genchef, Meals on Wheels, Pat and the Elephant, Palliative Care, veterans and their families, and contributed to bursaries for students. Bill, I am proud to call you a friend, and on behalf of District 14 Charlottetown West Royalty, I want to thank you for your service to our country, this island, and veterans' legacy past and present. Thank you, sir. A 
And Bill, at this time, when members have open remarks or statements, I always use a time, they're always on a time, 40 second timer. Today, as we have a veteran in the gallery, and not only yourself, but across this country, I put the timer away. <laughs> of member statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Morrison has repeatedly asked Islanders to stay home when they're sick, and that's great advice, but it's difficult to follow if you don't have paid sick days. And on top of that, most of the folks who don't have paid sick days are likely low paid to begin with. A question to the Premier. You're always very adamant about following Dr. Morrison's recommendations. So how do you suggest that Islanders who don't have paid sick days follow her sound advice? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that every time Dr. Morrison has uh, uh, suggested advice. We followed it every single time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think during COVID, we've uh, understood that there were some uh, challenges. Uh, we reacted quickly uh, with help from the federal government to make sure there was uh, provisions for those who would be sick, Mr. Speaker, during COVID. Uh, I think there's a comprehensive review underway of the Employment Standards Act to change that, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I think uh, continue to follow that advice, Mr. Speaker. And I think governments are reacting quickly uh, to implement that uh, so people who can stay home when they're sick can get a day's pay, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader to official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, governments uh, across the country are working to implement paid sick days for their employees. The Premier was cultivating a relationship with his big city health guru, Doug Ford, Whoa. earlier this year. And <laughs> even Doug Ford understands that workers should be, have paid sick leave under their Employment Standards Act. A question to the Premier. Do you support more or less paid sick leave than your friend from Ontario? <laughs> My colleague and friend, Mr. Speaker, guilty. Guilty as charged. Uh, he's a good man, works hard for his constituents, and he's always had my back at the Premier's table, Mr. Speaker, and I'm grateful for his friendship. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with exactly what their, uh, the Ontario uh, uh, legislated position is that on three days. Okay, the Honourable Leader, thank you for your help there. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, I think that, as I say, uh, through our special leave fund here, we've been trying hard to help, Mr. Speaker, until we get this review under, undertaken. Uh, but uh, I think we will, uh, we will see uh, that uh, help continue into the future, Mr. Speaker. Where it lands, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I think we could probably do as good or better than Ontario. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The data shows that women are more likely to be part-time workers and more likely than men to worse, miss work due to illness, as they are far more likely to, than men to be caretakers for sick children and elders. Both of these suggest a greater need for legislated sick days to ensure island women do not fall behind. Question to the minister responsible for the status of women. Will you be standing up for women voting in favour of this paid sick leave legislation? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. I know my colleague um, sitting beside me here, I know him and his department are doing a thorough review of the Employment Standards Act, and certainly this is an area where I've been a, a voice, and I know that our women's groups out there have as well, and certainly will encourage uh, their view on the comprehensive review of the St Employment Standards Act as it relates to legislation um, today. I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, we've heard from workers who are worried that they're going to have to choose between income and going to work sick. Is It's really an impossible choice, one that will push them into further food insecurity or put them behind in their rent. 
if not putting them on the street. Question to the Minister for Social Development and Housing. Will you support legislative sick leave to ensure these islanders have the income they need to afford the basics? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, certainly this has been a, a topic in the session for some time now. Uh, when I was in economic growth, tourism, culture, I had uh, quite a few meetings with the, the minister and, and other prov uh, with other provinces as well, Mr. Speaker, and they want one system, Mr. Speaker, that every province is going to follow. I think everybody can say that, that there is a need for paid sick days. Nobody's ever questioned that at all, Mr. Speaker. It's just the format, what it looks like, and how we get there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford. In other provinces, we're seeing hospitals and emergency rooms overrun with sick Canadians. This is placing an incredible strain on our health care system and, of course, our frontline health care workers. Government should always be looking for policy changes to help reduce the strain on our health care systems. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Do you think legislated paid sick leave would be a helpful tool to help to prevent illness and reduce the strain on our health care system? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I, like uh, the Honourable Member, uh, certainly appreciate the tremendous time, the tremendous effort and dedication that all of our health care workers uh, right across the province uh, have put in uh, over the last number of years, Mr. Speaker, but certainly over the last two and a half years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I certainly I look forward to uh, the debate on uh, the bill later this afternoon and the discussion surrounding that. Thank you. The Honourable Minister or Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Premier is on record saying that Islanders should tighten their belts when facing the high cost of living. A question to the Deputy Premier. For Islanders who are a paycheck away from hunger or homelessness, who can't afford to take a day off of work when, without pay, is your advice to go to work sick or to tighten your belt? Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Uh, uh, we are facing very hard times as a province and as a country, and uh, we will, as a, as a government, we will do what we can for Islanders. We'll continue to do that, and as many of my colleagues have said, we look forward to a review of the Employment Standard Act, and I would say the same thing. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. Mr. Speaker, question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. As a minister, you have paid sick days. What do you think about the fact that many of your constituents do not? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. I think that uh, I'm very interested in hearing about the debate today on this bill that's being brought forward, but I'm also very interested in the reviews being done as it applies to the Workers' Standards Act and, and the employment of all Islanders. Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On numerous occasions this year, the Kings County Memorial Hospital has been closed or reduced its capacity due to COVID outbreaks. This means reduced access to health care for Three Rivers residents due to preventable illness. Question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Do you think paid sick days would help reduce the strain on KCMH and help keep your hospital open? Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I figured I was probably the next one on the list. <laughs> I, I would agree with uh, my, my other uh, men, uh, caucus or fellow colleagues in Cabinet that I do believe that no one is against uh, paid sick days, and I, I do. Yeah. How we get there and how many that is, and as I mentioned, there's a review of the, the Employment Standard Act. Is it 10? Is it 2? Is it 1? I don't know what that answer is, but as uh, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities said, I look forward to that debate later this afternoon. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have labor shortages on PEI in all areas, and it's important that we keep our workforce healthy to minimize disruption and maintain productivity. Workers can't wait to be healthy in two years from now when we might see some outcomes of the Employment Standards Act review. They can't wait for that legislation to change. It needs to happen now. Of economic growth, tourism, and culture, do you support paid sick days and keeping island workers as healthy as possible? Bravo, Mr. Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as 
An island and as the minister, I do recognize the shift in the landscape of the workforce here on Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. All workers are uh, at a premium right now, Mr. Speaker, and the labor force is, is at an all-time uh, high, Mr. Speaker. We have record number of employment and we have a record number of un uh, unemployment, which has never been seen before in this island, Mr. Speaker. That's why we need to do a comprehensive review, and we're in the middle of this comprehensive review, Mr. Speaker, of the Employment Standards Act that hasn't been reviewed since 2006. Mr. Sp Speaker, I look forward to modernizing this act so all workers across this island have the best protection going. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I have the sneaking suspicion there might be a, a review of the Employment Standards Act under, <laughs> underway at the moment. And as the Minister said, it hasn't been reviewed since 2006. Now, this government does not have a snappy record of doing reviews of legislation and bringing them forward to this House. And in the meantime, we need new legislation to ensure that all islanders have paid sick days here on Prince Edward Island. Question to the Premier. You were off sick for a couple of days last week, and you're going to get paid for those days, of course. Don't you think that all islanders should enjoy the same privilege? Mr. Mr. Speaker, again, I would say that everybody over here has been saying the same thing. I don't know why it seems so uh, offensive to the opposition over there. I think we all agree that we need to have something that is defined where everybody gets treated fairly, Mr. Speaker, and that the labor force is protected and their general health and overall is protected, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're all in agreement. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. That's great, and I look forward to support for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke's bill this afternoon when it comes up for debate. So, moving on to another topic of great concern to all islanders. Last week, the Minister of Environment said that government was going to continue to flex its muscles, as he put it, when it comes to regulating development in sensitive areas. And in discussions on a project at Point de Roche, time and again, both the Environment Minister and the Agriculture and Land Ministers assured islanders that no laws were being broken and the proper process was being followed. Question to the Premier. Do you also believe that all legislation and regulation regarding development within buffer zones and fully complying with setback restrictions are being followed in this case? Mr. Speaker, I haven't been given a full detailed brief on that topic. I uh, put great faith in my ministers, Mr. Speaker, who do their jobs exceptionally well, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps the person who sat in this chair before me was a micromanager. I'm not, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what they said seems to hold true, Mr. Speaker, but obviously the honorable uh, leader is going to take, uh, take objection to that, I suppose. So I guess we'll hear what comes next. The honorable leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'll just carry on. The Minister of Agriculture and Land, one of his trusted colleagues, went on to say this about the permit that was issued, and I quote, My department is the department that would issue the building permit, so that was done. And it was done as per the parameters of the regulations, end quote. To the Premier, do you agree that this development is being carried out within the parameters of the regulations as stipulated, as stated, sorry, by the Minister of Agriculture and Land? Again, Mr. Speaker, I haven't been involved in the day-to-day -day of this here. Mr. Speaker, I delegate those duties to the responsibilities of the ministries, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the ministers and the professionals who do that every day, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would uh, say I would have no reason to believe that uh, what they're telling the, the House, Mr. Speaker, is uh, any different than uh, what I would be telling them if I had a full brief on the issue, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, Cabinet was the one that issued this permit, and I, as far as I know, the Premier would sit on Cabinet. So there, there, there would be discussion in Cabinet on issuing this permit. Uh, I, I can tell you definitively, I can tell you definitively, I'm going to give the Premier the briefing that he's looking for, I can tell you definitively that, that, it, that it is not happening, that this is not meeting the parameters within the parameters of the regulations or the legislation. It's being carried out because of a grandfathering yes. policy that apparently exists between the Departments of Environment and Land. A question to the Minister of Agriculture and Land. What is this policy? Where can I find it? And will you table it immediately so that islanders can see what this minor policy is that's allowing some developers, with government's blessing, to violate the laws of our province? Yes. 
since I was referenced at the beginning, perhaps I could take the first part of the question, and uh, I would be a little sketchy on the briefing, Mr. Speaker, that I'm getting here from the Leader of the Opposition, because he doesn't know how government seems to work. Uh, cabinet doesn't approve permits, Mr. Speaker. They don't come to Cabinet to approve permits. I guess how would he know that never being around the Cabinet table? I, so I forgive him for that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's easy to point for boogeymans around the, this and that and the other thing, Mr. Speaker. But contrary to what he and others want to believe, Mr. Speaker, there are defined policies that government have in place that need to be followed, Mr. Speaker, and that's what happened in this regard. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. So, policies exist across government, of course, and they are there to expand on the regulations and laws that exist. They're not there to override or to contradict the laws that exist, and that is what's happening in this case, and that is why this is such a problem. So, the Premier and this government needs to remove this offending policy which, which is contradicting and overriding, overriding the, the laws of this land and to make sure that his government actually starts to follow your own laws. In the meantime, Premier, will you rescind the permit for Point de Roche development that was allowed to commence because of this policy and which so clearly violates existing legislation and regulation? I would say, quite honestly, to the Leader of the Opposition, if he can show me where a law was broken, Mr. Speaker, I would turn it over in two seconds, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, last week, the member for Charlottetown Victoria Park asked the Minister of Education if the Child and Youth Advocate supported the idea of removing the requirement for vulnerable sector checks for some people in child care centres. And the House was clearly told that his office did support this change. Mm -hmm. To the Education Minister, do you stand by that position now? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly appreciated the debate on the floor last week. I wasn't involved directly with the consultations uh, with the Child and Youth Advocate Office. I certainly don't know the intricate details of it. I do trust my staff um, regarding their their uh, their definition of, of how the conversation ensued, but I appreciate uh, the concerns that were raised by the Child and Youth Advocate Office, and I'm certainly willing and committed to working with them on a positive step forward. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important to note that the letter I tabled on Friday, which was addressed to all party leaders, makes it very clear that the Child and Youth Advocate thinks that this change would be a risk for children and that he did not feel that he was consulted on this mm -hmm. point at all. To the same minister, will you be walking back from the attempt to remove protections for our youngest children, or do you still intend to push this through the House? Education, lifelong learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And by, by no means was the intent to walk back on some of these, this the vulnerable record check, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am fully committed to working with all of our stakeholders, including the honourable member across the House, on a positive step forward. So, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm looking forward to those discussions, and I know we'll get to a place where we all agree what is right for the children. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Valley Sherbrooke. There's still a lot of confusion out there about where the medical homes and neighbourhoods will be, what they will contain, and when they will be operational. A question to the Minister of Health. Is the Tyne Valley Health Care Centre a part of a medical neighbourhood, and if so, which one? Very much, Mr. Speaker. At this point in time, the answer is it is not part of any medical home at this time. Thank you. John Valley Sherbrooke. Well, that is very concerning to hear um, and very shocking. I'm sure it will be very shocking for those who are uh, patients of that centre, particularly because we know that Dr. Montgomery, who works out of the Time Valley Healthcare Centre, has been letting patients know that he's going to be retiring very soon. This centre has an excellent nurse practitioner, Gerbeer Martin, who has formed relationships and built trust in the community. Question to the Minister of Health. What will happen to the Time Valley Healthcare Centre, its staff and its patients when Dr. Montgomery retires? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, uh, we are extremely fortunate to have an excellent nurse practitioner out of the Tyne Valley Medical Centre. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member would uh, appear from her line of questioning 
feel that we should be forcing all of our primary care providers, whether it's nurse practitioners, whether it's diabetic nurses, whether it's our family doctors, into participation in medical homes. Uh, we are not going to make that, enforce that, to tell them if you're going to be here in PEI, but that's how you're going to practice. We collaborate, we work with ones, Mr. Uh, speaker, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Now the leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I want to go back to the topic we were just talking about because I directed one of my questions to the Minister of uh, Agriculture and Land, and it was about tabling the policy that exists, apparently exists, between her department and the Department of Environment. So I'm going to ask her again, will you table this policy which violates the rules and the regulations and the laws of this province? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and uh, Honourable Member. I do not know of a policy that violates the rules and regulations of the province, but I will be happy to table any information I have regarding grandfathering in or any other uh, parameters around what happened with the property. But all I can tell you is, through our department and through environment, we worked with the owner to ensure that he met the parameters of the province. Larry Inverness. Thanks, uh, in the legislature last week, I asked the Minister of Health about COVID or retention incentives been given to health PEI senior leadership, while other hardworking health care providers received cheap flashlights and lavender seeds. The Minister responded by saying no dollar incentive was given to senior leadership. But that's not what I'm hearing out there, Mr. Speaker. And this Minister's been very cagey with some of his answers, so I'm going to refrain my question to the Minister and we'll sort of take it from there. So listen carefully, Minister. Question to the Minister of Health. With, within the past year, were Health PEI senior leadership provided with any bonus, extras, or added vacation time as a COVID thank you or a retention incentive? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank my colleague uh, across the way for the question. I assure my colleague that I always listen with great intent to his questions, because he normally does have great questions, normally. But with that, Mr. Speaker, my answer last week was in reference to uh, uh, the comment made by the Honourable Member that a $2,000 bonus was paid to senior management to uh, our executive leadership team. Mr. Speaker, I had heard that previously. I went back to the department, I went back to Health PEI, because I wanted to find out if that actually was the case. And with regard to a $2,000 bonus, Mr. Speaker, the answer unequivocally that I received and that I had passed on to the honorable member was no. Larry and Vanessa. Mr. Speaker, because I asked the question, did senior leadership staff receive any bonuses or extras or added vacation time for the COVID? Thank you. Do you want to, did they receive anything for that? Because I hear that they did get vacation time and they can cash that vacation time in, Mr. Speaker. So I think it's really important that the Minister of Health be very upfront. So we'll, I ask the question again, did they receive any kind of bonus like vacation time? Donovan Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you look over the last uh, uh, two, two and a half year period since the middle of March of, uh, of 2020, when we got smashed, smashed, Mr. Speaker, in right across the province, but certainly within our health care se sector uh, with uh, COVID-19 and the response that was necessary to COVID-19. Everybody within the system, Mr. Speaker, including our ELT, our senior managers, our middle managers, went above and beyond, put in substantial extra hours in dealing with this, Mr. Speaker. There was no cash incentive, no bonuses paid cash-wise. But yes, Mr. Speaker, as any good employer would do, they acknowledge that, yes, extra time was put in, and when available, that that extra time should be given back 
whether it's uh, with uh, time off in lieu or what have you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Larry Inverness for second supplementary. So now it does sound like they did receive some bonuses that came back in vacation time, to which I'm still kind of curious whether they did be able to cash that in, because I've heard that they can cash that in. Mr. Speaker, I think it's very important that we note that some people are getting incentives, some people are getting cash, some people are getting vacation time, and some people are getting nothing but uh, flashlights and uh, lavender seeds, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister stand up in this house and basically apologize to say that we need to do better. We are going to provide other bonuses and other incentives to all these other hardworking people like lab technicians, respirologists, cooks and the like, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, you walk over the last uh, four-year period uh, thereabouts uh, since government was formed. Have we done better? Can we do better? Absolutely. <laughs> But with that, Mr. Speaker, what we have done, we have stepped up in a number of instances. And let's just look across the board, Mr. Speaker. Let's look across the board. The number of programs, the expansion of programs that have been put in place. You look at the budget that health had when we came to power and the budget now. Mr. Speaker, there has been a $200 million increase in the health care funding in this province. And what that is for, what that is for, Mr. Speaker, is to do the best that we can right across the board for our 200 million increase. Charlottetown West Royalty. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And uh, this morning I, I, uh, I went by uh, 501 Queen um, to, to just have a look at that center. Obviously, you know that it's, it had a lot of water damage in it. And I just want to say thank you to the staff. The staff have been there quite quite often, and they've they've done they've done a good job of cleaning the water up. My concern is the the water and what we're expecting for this weekend. So, a question to the minister: What has your department done at 501 Queen to ensure the rain and water will not be a concern for this for these residents this weekend? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's a great question, Honourable Member. So uh, the last update I had was yesterday morning. Uh, the original update I got was from uh, someone living in uh, Fago One Queen uh, at a call at 10 after 7 the other morning uh, that also sent me pictures in, uh, in the water that was in, in the unit, uh, Mr. Speaker. So uh, staff immediately went out. Uh, they looked to see what was going on. We did have a contractor hired on to patch the roof until the metal roof gets put in. Uh, the water did leak through, so the staff had went back out to tighten everything up to make sure it gets done. And my understanding, the contractor is supposed to be out uh, immediately uh, to fix this once and for all with a with a metal roof, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty. I appreciate you taking you taking action, but the residents there are they're they're, they're very they're very worried for this weekend. Uh, um, you know, it was coming in. It was raining inside inside the building. So um, I'm just I'm just kind of concerned about that, and, and just putting the minister on notice. To, to I know the staff are there watching, but this is a very big concern. So you're responsible for over a thousand public housing units across Prince Edward Island. Can you share the plan, the, the planning and actions your department completed to mitigate any negative effects to weather on residents of all your units across the province post Fiona? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Honourable Member, I don't have any of that with me, but I can certainly go back to the Department. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, there's a significant list of, uh, of what's going to be done, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know what needs to be done. Uh, the plan is in place. Uh, the capital budget has a significant ask in there right now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's there's an uh, endless amount of work that needs to happen in these units. Uh, we know the units have been neglected for years, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we got all hands on deck. So uh, uh, we met yesterday morning. Uh, a lot of the jobs are booked, uh, contractors are ready to go, and uh, we'll be getting the work done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty, your second supplementary. Th thank you for that answer. I'll just, I'll, I just remain concerned about this weekend. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, Islanders, uh, uh, Islanders' unhoused population will also be trying to shield from the weather of this weekend. I hope proactive planning has occurred to support them. Um, uh, question to the Minister. H has the date for the opening of the modular uh, housing units, has that been uh, pushed back? And are, are you able to provide any shelter for this weekend for the un our unhealthed population? Thank you. Yeah. 
Honourable Nurse, our Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can get a, an update on, on the modular units to, to see how we're progressing. Uh, but what I can say with, uh, with the bad weather coming, that my staff has uh, uh, secured more uh, shelter supports uh, for this weekend if needed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that is being looked after as well, as well as all our seniors' homes are being checked on uh, as we speak uh, to make sure they have all the resources they need, as well as we have backup generators lined up for the buildings that we can use them just to be prepared for this weekend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone trying to build housing right now in the province, I'm sure all the uh, Honourable Members have heard the same, uh, same stories. You know, there's construction costs which are escalating, fuel costs which are escalating, labour shortages right across the Construction Association, of course, the supply chain issues which are starting to uh, slow down a little bit. But one of the other added things is the maze of permits and approvals that, you know, one has to go through, especially as we are in a housing shortage uh, right now in the province question to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. What are the permits and approvals required from the province to build a new multi-unit housing unit in any municipality across PEI? Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so that's a good question. Right now, uh, as a municipality or a developer provide, uh, makes an application to a permit into a municipality, uh, that application is put into government for review by my department uh, through Municipal Affairs, and then from there, uh, it goes on to the Department of uh, uh, Lands for final approval and sign up by the Minister. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so, again, as we are in a housing shortage, um, you know, I, I think with all of these pressures that are put on developers across PEI, the Minister had mentioned that it goes from, let's use the City of Charlottetown, we'll start with the City, you apply to the City, then you go next to the Minister's Department, goes to another department, and I believe it goes back to your department and then back to the City. Would the Minister of Fisheries and Communities agree that this process maybe seems a little bit confusing? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, it's a it's uh, too complicated. Um, it's, it's being reviewed by the, the developer, it's being reviewed by the city, then it's being reviewed by my department, then it's being reviewed by the, the, the minister from lands and her department, and then it's signed off and go back. And we are actually in the process right now of taking one whole um, component out of there, so it's going to go directly from the city to the director, or pardon me, to the Department of Lands for approval, and then back. So municipal affairs, we don't need to review these things. We trust the, the city, we trust also the Department of Lands, and we're taking that whole phase right out of there. Charlottetown Winslow, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the minister is action-oriented, so I hope that that does come to fruition, because again, again, this is a time when developments need to be going because we are, I know the Minister of Social Development and Housing is trying to get that number of occupancy down to 4% or up to 4% rather. So uh, my question is, you know, will you commit to engaging with the City of Charlottetown or the Department, as you mentioned, to get this so we can cut out those steps? Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will commit to that, and I will commit to coming back to the House and on the Honourable Member and actually provide an update on it as soon as possible. My, my focus right now is to have this other way by at the latest, of 1 January at the latest. Thank you. Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, recently the province launched the Pharmacy Plus uh, um, initiative and to expand access to care uh, to islanders through local pharmacies. And the idea, Mr. Speaker, being that providing another pathway to care through our community pharmacies might lessen pressure on our emergency rooms, walk-in clinics, and our doctor's office. All the makings of a phenomenal initiative, Mr. Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. I'm really interested in the early reaction to this change. How many islanders are using this new pathway to care? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable uh, Member uh, for the question. Uh, certainly the Pharmacy Plus PEI program, a uh, great initiative. Uh, with, and I want to thank our, uh, our partners, uh, the pharmacists and the Pharmacy Association, for their very collective, collaborative uh, uh, work with, uh, with us on this initiative. Uh, specifically, uh, the uptake, Mr. Speaker, it has been, in my opinion, it has been fantastic. Uh, I do believe that well over 2,100 Islanders 
made use of this over the first 16 days after the program was launched. Thank you. Rustical Emerald. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And that does sound like a very encouraging start to the program. Um, and uh, I mean, it's so good to see that pharmacists are now being directly compensated for these services, some of which they provided for, for free in the past. Um, minutes, question to the Minister. How many types of assessments are being performed through the Pharmacy Plus program so far? And are there any you know, early patterns emergent, emerging? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank um, the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, there's uh, 38 common ailments that can be assessed and uh, diagnosed, prescribed for under this program, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with regard to uh, patterns that, uh, that we may see uh, developing or have seen developing, uh, it's again an excellent question uh, that, uh, that uh, is being monitored. And uh, with regard to the statistics on that, Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to go back to the Department and bring that information back. Thank you. Rustical Emerald, your second supplementary. Uh, well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the, the contract with the PEI Pharmacists Association was negotiated in 2012, but it expired in 2016. I guess the, the previous Liberal administration was trying to cut costs on the back of pharmacists, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, not expand the paid services to help our whole health system. So. Um, Mr. Speaker, we're living in an inflationary economy, and um, the cost with, uh, with, with pro providing services that pharmacies provide has definitely increased since 2016. I just want to know, what is the status of contract negotiations? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank uh, uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Yes, and unlike uh, previous administration, we are not going to be confrontational with the Pharmacy Association or our pharmacists. Uh, we are working with them. We've expanded. We've expanded what uh, pharmacist technicians what they can do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you look at the reimbursement and the the partnership again with our pharmacist with regard to whether it's uh, flu shots, Mr. Speaker, whether it's with regard to the Shingrix vaccine, and I could go on and on, uh, Mr. Speaker, but the negotiations are proceeding with the Pharmacy Association. And at this point, I just want to take uh, a brief uh, second here, Mr. Speaker, to give a shout out to Erin McKenzie, who is doing a great job in her position with the Pharmacy Association. Thank you. I'm sorry, so thrive. Mr. Speaker, through the week there is good, not perfect, uh, a good, not perfect schedule of transit between Summerside and Charlottetown. On the weekend, though, the schedule is far less robust. In fact, no transit. PEI Transit operates Monday to Friday. I have a constituent who makes great use of transit, loves to use it, but wonders why she can't still be as mobile using it on the weekends. It's not just getting to work and school and back that True Transit serves. Not everyone works Monday to Friday. Not everyone has other options for being mobile if transit is unavailable. If we want to see a truly successful system, we need to make it a valid choice every day for everyone. A question to the Minister. Is there any plan to expand the PEI transit system to have it operate on the weekend? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are looking at that to see if it's an option, to see how much it would be utilized. Obviously, we would want more than you know, one or two people on the bus, but um, we are looking at it currently right now to see if it is a viable option. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Speaker, the absence of snow fencing on Bunbury Road near, near Fullerton's Marsh last, last year resulted in that stretch of road being dangerous and impassable at times. I have had discussions with officials from the Department of Transportation who have agreed with me and committed to install the snow fencing this year. So question to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Yes. There will be flurries. We've had flurries. So when will the snow fencing on Bunbury Road be installed? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. S Hopefully they're not too heavy of flurries. Um, I know you did speak with uh, officials in our department, and I believe that you, sir, you came to an agreement and you were happy with, uh, with that result. Um, I can find out when we're going to install that. I would imagine it's very soon, before the ground freezes. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. A few years ago, uh, a couple of constituents of mine were injured by violent dogs that were running at large in the municipality. And I found out that because of issues with the legislation, the Dog Act, actually nothing can be done to deal with problematic dogs or their owners in many parts of Prince Edward Island, especially within our small rural municipalities. So I tried to fix that a couple of years ago, but the minister at the time I wanted to put forward his own bill to fix the issue, but that, of course, never happened. A question to the new Minister of Agriculture and Land. Will you fix the Dog Act so that rural islanders are properly protected? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Land. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Honourable Member, we'll do whatever we can to keep islanders safe. I know it's been an issue in the Department, and I'll continue to work with them to ensure that uh, we can do in the Act what we need to. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, final question. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So the, the, one of the other issues in rural areas is the vitality of our economy and how dependent that is on good internet service. And we rely increasingly on good, reliable, high-speed internet in order for families to do their work from home, in order for students to be able to do their schooling properly, and all kinds of other things. And PEI, unfortunately, is still suffering from some gaps in our internet service, particularly in rural areas. Uh, ExploreNet was one of the companies that was tasked with filling in these gaps, and they had 12 areas where they were going to be providing a fiber backbone in order to fill in those gaps. A question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Is ExploreNet on track to meet that agreement that it has with the province to provide good, reliable, fast internet service for all rural islanders. The Honorable Minister, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that's a great question, because uh, when uh, we first came into this legislature, Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, as a government, uh, uh, I'll have to give credit to the former minister. He really took this file to the next level, Mr. Speaker, where today, we rarely get a call about internet in our in our office. It's it's that it's that good. But Mr. Speaker, to answer the question, we are on schedule. We are on schedule. Oh my light up. I feel I might have triggered something over there, Mr. Speaker. But with the 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 available uh, P, uh, uh, broadband fund, Mr. Speaker, over two and a half million dollars was spent on that to get some of those trouble areas, Mr. Speaker, so people can work from home on, on this island, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to build that. We'll continue to work with the federal government to ensure that we have all internet for all communities across this island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter from the Animal Justice Canada Legislative Fund. And it is a letter for the upcoming Residential Tenancy Act, where um, Humane, PEI Humane Society saw a 75% increase in companion animal intakes in 2021 over the previous year. The highest year-over-year -year increase of shelter has ever seen. And this group is proposing that PEI include a provision in the new Residential Tenancy Act to protect the interests of families with non-human companion animals. Um, and I move, seconded by the member from Mermaid Stratford, that the said document now be received and do lie on the table. Shut up, Carrie. Anyone else for tabling of documents? No? Uh, reports by committees? The Honourable Member from Summerside Wilmot, recognition of guests? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your indulgence, I would like to recognize a few people who came into the gallery a little later. We do have Marcella Carota, Heather Ford, and Toby McDonald with us today, and we're just so happy to have you here. So <laughs> welcome. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. Deputy Premier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Shall I carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker to chair the committee of the whole House, please. The House is now in the committee of the whole House to consider the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Honourable yeah. members, we are on page 19, Capital Expenditure Health PEI. Under the section Capital Improvements, this section has been read and is currently under debate. Could you please? State your name and position for Hansard. Uh, Gordon McFadgen, Executive Director, Fiscal Management. Thank you very much and welcome back. Mermaid Stratford. Um, I believe it was yesterday I was asking about the underspent money from last year. So we had budgeted $30 million and the actual spent was just shy of $20 million. And I'd ask for more detail on that, and um, in response I'd heard that it was well detailed in the handout that we received. But in fact, the handout that we received really only gives numbers as to mm -hmm. what the underspend was, but it doesn't give an explanation as to why it was underspent and the, and the reasoning around that. Um, so for instance, the community health center at the mental health campus was underspent by almost $600,000. Um, $550,000, and I didn't see any description in the handout as to why that underspend. I'm wondering if you have that level of detail with you. Uh, generally, for, for all these capital projects, it's, it's a matter of timing. So, again, they're, they're multi-year uh, projects. Um, staff, uh, when coming up with the initial plans for uh, implementation, would come up with the suggested cash flow. Um, and each time that we have a check-in here um, with, uh, with a forecast and, and last year's budget and the new estimate, um, there is an opportunity to kind of reevaluate where each one of the projects uh, are at. And, and that does indeed does happen. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And in my experience of dealing with capital projects, um, typically you follow them every quarter to find out where you are in spend, and we're underspent by $10 million right now. Is there ability to early start any projects that might have been in year two or year three of that capital budget so that you can actually spend the money that you had, um, that was earmarked to, to spend? Does that make sense? Like usually you wouldn't want to leave the table, the, the money unspent, but you have to know well in advance that you're going to underspend. And it looks like you know that well in advance because, you know, we still have another four months left for this capital budget. So is there ability to early start any capital projects, whether it be for the, you know, looking into early um, consultation or anything like that to make up that $10 million or will that $10 million just go unspent? Well, I... I I think the the actual next five year plan would take that into account, um, and I think one of the examples, and it's not particularly within this section, but uh, 
I think uh, a call Francois Biot was advanced up. There was some room, as you say, in the, in the capital forecast. Um, I note that although this section is under some, some sections are over. So mm -hmm. as, as government, we're, we're looking at fiscal management in particular. We're looking at the overall budget as well as the individual departmental budgets um, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a balancing act. Um, generally, it's the same group of people that would be kind of organizing the work, um, the same group of experts uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, on the community health centers, if you wanted to use that as an example. Um, so they're, they're looking at all of their projects all the time to see um, how best and, and how quickly they can get things implemented. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Thanks, Chair. And that's, you know, exactly my point and why I always refer back to business cases because when you have that funnel filled, you have an idea of what can be early start done as an early start so that you can spend the money in the year that you said that you were going to spend it, right? And we've seen some surpluses come from this government um, in operational budget, which leads me to believe that um, we're not tracking that on a quarterly basis as closely as we could be. Um, and if we actually had proper governance where you are doing business cases and ready to go early on projects, um, we're missing the opportunity, and we end up underspending in critical areas that we've identified as priority. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd categorize it as underspending per se. Um, I think I've referred to it uh, as, as cash flow. Um, when I think about underspending, I think about um, if I had a project that was designed for 30,000 square feet at, you know, $3 million, and I built 20,000 square feet at $2 million, that, that's an underspend. Difference, um, um, majority of, of the lines you were referring to are, are large multi-year projects that uh, need to kind of get their feet underneath them, need to get the planning done, need to get uh, the appropriate land secured in some cases, and mm -hmm. in some cases land cleared before it can be secured. Um, so definitely there are some factors that uh, come into play. Um, and I know that uh, Health PEI is working hard every day to try to get these buildings moving as fast as they can. And uh, But when you say underspend, I take in a capital budget is different than operating because mm -hmm. I'm looking at a project budget over the, the total horizon of, uh, of, of time. Mm -hmm. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And that's fair, but when I, uh, when I, I, I totally understand what, how you've just described it, but when we say that we're going to go for an envelope of money of $30 million, but we only spend $20 million of that, um, how we define that, fine, but at the end of the day, we're only going back out for $20 million when we said, okay, we're allocating $30, 000, or $30 million, and, you know, the request was to Islanders that the government have the ability to spend that 30 million and then we don't. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, the way that we might discuss that in finance terms, mm -hmm. really at the end of the day we have not spent the full 30 million dollars that was earmarked to be spent in the capital budget from last year. For sure, and, and on a project specific basis the cash flow may not match exactly um, the, the plan as it was laid out this time last year. Um, we, we're, we're looking at each one of these projects on, on a project by project basis to see within, um, within the authority that has been provided, I'll use the $30 million, did that project achieve that milestone? If it exceeded the milestone, um, they have to come back and, and talk to Treasury Board about that. And, and sometimes that happens when actual tenders come in or tenders go out when we really know what the, the market will, will uh, uh, ask us to provide for this particular project um, and it's not until we kind of start with the shovels in the ground that we can really f firmly kind of establish the, the the timeline and the eventual cash flows um, you know overall again we're looking at a very micro and, and I would use the you know the example of a project within an overall capital budget from fiscal management standpoint, we're looking at this along with many others to try to balance off the overall spend for government. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And, um, you know, back in the 80s when we built all the schools, the 70s, 80s, back when we built all the schools, many of the hospitals, a lot of the government buildings that we have out there, we actually had a full department that was allocated to planning, right? We no longer have that department. Now I think there's people within different 
departments that you know would kind of take on that role and then by and large the pressure is then put on the the department of or the division of infrastructure to try to carry this load and there's a lot of projects right that are going to go into that department and i i do have a big concern with the um, level of work that is being placed on the shoulders of those employees because we have a lot of things coming down the pipe in which a lot of project management has to happen but i'm not necessarily sure that we have the ability to actually accomplish what's being written down on a piece of paper uh, in this document um, so i think that we have challenges there um, when i was talking we were talking yesterday about about business cases and it was um, uh, i was asking about um, a solid business plan for our community health centers. And like I said, I mean, this is something that our caucus has asked about for the last four capital uh, budgets. We've been in support of this type of community health care um, um, structure. But it, that doesn't mean that we don't need to have proper numbers in place and a, and a solid business plan for all of our projects. And so I want to go back to this again, and I want to understand um, the role of a board is usually that they would approve um, they would approve those plans, and then it would go forward. So I'm wondering if you have an approval process from the Health PEI board for all of the spending in Health PEI's budget. Um, it's, it's my understanding that the capital plan, along with the operating plan, is presented to the board for their approval and recommendation to the minister. The minister has the ultimate authority within uh, the health sector to put forward the capital request on behalf of the corporation. So I, I suspect there is a, an iterative process that would be involved between the board and the minister. Uh, then the minister would submit to a treasury board that has the ultimate uh, responsibility for fiscal management within the, the province to uh, actually set a budget for for health PEI. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So, has the Department of Finance been given the assurance from the board uh, from the board members from Health PEI that they have signed off on the business plans or the business ideas? Um, if, when there isn't, doesn't seem to be a plan on paper, um, that they have signed off on the on all of this spending. Again, we, we received the information from the Department of Health on behalf of Health PEI, so um, I, I presume, as the minister is the ultimate accountability within that, that the, the board has reviewed and uh, signed off on the submission to uh, the minister, the minister to Treasury Board, Treasury Board to. Um, the final budget document to this house for approval. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So if the board has signed off on this, is that something that you can table? I, I'd have to check to see if there's an actual document, but I, I can check for you. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. And do you know if there's board minutes through the budget capital budget planning process I, between Health PEI I, I, and the board? I have no, I have no idea. Mermaid Stratford. Um, so my understanding, the, the um, minister's responsibility in this is to sure, ensure that the, um, that the spending complies with policies of the government of, of Prince Edward Island. So, and then at that point in time, like, uh, like the business case, like there's a development for a business case for the medical homes. So my assumption is, is that there has to be some sort of business case um, that was completed. Like this is, you know, I've, I've had several people reach out to me last night who had worked for government entities and have described the, the process and how, um, you know, how rigorous it is for those government entities to get money from Treasury Board. And now they don't have to present their capital budget, their money, their uh, the funding in the capital budget, like for instance, Energy Corp doesn't have to, and Island Waste Watch doesn't have to do that. They might have to go through Treasury Board, but they don't have to go through this process, which tells me that this is different. And so, the Board of Directors in that section, in that those corporations, would actually be doing a very rigorous process to ensure that the money is being spent in the way that is going to benefit Islanders. 
I'm finding it difficult, Chair, here to not have that information in front of the Legislative Assembly so that when we sign off on $33 million, although I might, we might agree with everything in that, you know, it's gone through some sort of process, but there's no actual tangible, tr tangible proof that it's gone through any kind of process. Um, and that there's been sign off for it. So that's what I'm struggling and I'm wondering if that can be tabled to the members of the Legislative Assembly so that we can ensure that we're making a decision that has gone through all the proper steps in order to ensure that the right eyes have been on it and that it is in the best interest of Islanders. Okay, I, I'm gonna, these questions were asked yesterday afternoon, uh, quite a few questions on the same, um, topic, um, and I really believe that they gave you the answers that they have available to them. So they explained the process they uh, multiple times. So I'm just going to ask, we don't have those answers here. Um, I have de definitely don't have the answers. They've answered it, again, several times, um, with multiple different ways it was asked um, about the process. So I'm just going to ask, member, if we could move on to another question, please. Yeah. And for the record, Chair, I'm going to be asking the same questions in social development and housing on those housing starts as well, because this is not a loan to health PEI. This is just proper governance that Islanders expect that our government should be going through and that those processes are well defined and that that information is provided to them. So I'm going to ask it again uh, under know, a different uh, section. That's fine. When we get to that section, we can, we can deal with that. But I do understand where you're coming from, and that's why I've allowed this to, to get to this point. I really, truly do understand why, but I also believe that you're getting the answers that um, they have the knowledge of, just the, their limited knowledge that they have. You know, when someone's sitting on the floor trying to defend um, capital expenditures, they don't know all the ins and outs of it and what's the, what, what the details are of each ask. So, um, and I know you can appreciate that. So we're going to move on at this point, and if you want to start that into another uh, department, you have the right to ask. Okay. Mayor Mike Stafford. And for the record, I have said several times since I took this seat in the House that I think that the ministers responsible for the different areas should be dis defending, or at least their deputy ministers should be present, so that they can answer those questions for us. The, uh, just a statement, it's and, not and a question. And we're following the, I guess, the, the legislative practice. assembly practice. Yes. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go back to KCMH. Um, so it's my understanding that construction will begin in 26-27? Sure, I'm on the right spot here. Um, during the fiscal year 26-27. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So what is the estimated time that that, um, that, that new facility will be open? Um, I, I don't have that information here. Um, Again, it would be part and parcel uh, with what comes out of the master program, master plan as to uh, what services and, and programs will be uh, included in the building. Um, the size of the building will dictate the, the length of time of construction, uh, whether it's potential renovation or a new build. It's the, all of those things are will be on the table during the, the planning cycle. Um, so it's a little, I believe, premature to say when it will be completed when we haven't even kind of got a concept of what we're going to build yet. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, and so, and I think it's interesting. I'm wondering if the residents of, of the area knows that it's likely not going to be come to fruition until 2030, really. Like, I mean, it's going to take a couple, a minimum a couple of years to build a new hospital, right? So is 2030 kind of a realistic timeline based on when the start of the hospital is um, being projected? The timeline will be the timeline based on the planning that is completed. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And there was a motion that was put forward by um, my colleague from Charlottetown Brighton that had um, spoken to all new builds should be built to net zero standard. So f for the foreseeable timeline that's been provided to us, commencement 2026, 2027, it's probably going to take a couple years to build it, which puts us in 2030. But when I asked if it was going to be built to um, net zero standards, um, the discussion was it would be net zero ready. How, how does that meet the commitment of this Legislative Assembly to, um, you know, to reduce their, the 
um, you know, the emissions down to zero by 2030 if we're not even willing to build net zero buildings in 2030. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question for sure. Um, we're definitely talking about the capacity and the technology that's here today and as we go down the road, you know, there might be new technologies, more efficient battery storage options and, and smaller solar arrays that will, will allow and, and, and geothermal and whatever else uh, is at the disposal of, uh, of the engineers, architects and planners at the time. I think the commit from from government is is there, and, and they'll be putting their uh, you know the best foot forward to uh, to uh, to make sure that the targets are met. Mermaid Stratford, I'll go with one more, and then we'll put you back on the list if you choose. Okay, great, Thank Mermaid you. Stratford. So, we're approximately what eight years before we have this new hospital in Montague. So, my question is about the current hospital and the state that the current hospital is in. So, if we're not going to really have a new hospital ready for almost a decade, um, there's a lot of upgrades and that kind of thing that is required. So, um, will there is there plans to ensure that that facility will be kept? Um, in good state of repair until um, we get a new hospital in that area? I think that's the commitment for all our facilities that uh, it's, it's in the shape that uh, the, it's you know, for staff and for the public. Um, within this capital budget for 23-24, um, there's a continuation of the building upgrades um, for the, the kitchen area and, and the front area that uh, while the master program and plan are completed, I think there's some roof repairs that are being um, planned. So um, absolutely, um, we need to keep, uh, keep stock and, and keep track and, and keep in good working order all the buildings that we have uh, until new facilities are available. Summer Side Wilmot. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here again, Gordon. It's always a pleasure. I'd like to ask some questions about the Summerside Medical Center that's been slated. I know you had said in the meantime, while we are waiting for these things to get off the ground like KMHC, we want the buildings to be in good condition, but that's definitely not true for the Summerside Medical Center. I had the option to, the opportunity, excuse me, to tour the Summerside uh, Harborside Clinic, actually, in particular. And there were literal plants coming in through the wall, through a hole in the floor. There was a, a lovely staff member who gave me the opportunity to sit in a rolling chair and watch that it would roll down the hall, which was alarming when you consider the fact that this is an active medical site. So when I see that we were budgeted to spend $10 million last year and we only spent 775000 it worries me that this project is getting delayed. You know, that's not a small No, that's, that's a significant uh, change in the cash flow, I would agree. Yeah. What can you tell me about why that happened? Um, I think that the, the single biggest reason was trying to get the site prepared and ready where they wanted to put the building. Um, uh, in the area of town, I think it's been designated up... Uh, towards the top end of Granville Street right. on uh, where the old Holland College building has since been been removed. Exactly. So it, it did take a little bit longer to get that site ready, but um, the plans are underway. It's architectural drawings are being prepared. I think it's it's finally going to have its legs underneath it and, and construction will, will commence uh, not imminently, but uh, in, in hopefully soon to get it up and running as fast as it can because um, as you mentioned, with, with Harborside, there is always a challenge with leased accommodations to try to keep landlords to, uh, to uh, be responsible for uh, their space and the space that's occupied. So that is an, an ongoing balance, and then that's why I believe they probably selected uh, to build their own center so that they could be you know, your, your own landlord and, and, and have those uh, issues dealt with uh, you know, firsthand. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I know it's really worrying for me because the geriatrician at the Harborside Center is upstairs and the elevator to get there frequently breaks. They've had numerous seniors trapped in the elevator and they find the staff are carrying seniors up and down a remarkably steep staircase. So it's, it's of pressing urgency that this building get underway. 
Do you think the fact that we spent so little of what we anticipated last year that it's going to push this project back significantly, or is there an opportunity to catch back up? Um, I, I've described the, the process for planning um, architectural design and, and capturing all um, the services and programs that wants to be in a particular site. That process has been completed. Uh, the actual design for tender-ready um, documents is underway. Um, so I, I believe that this project has turned a corner and that um, it will be ready for construction uh, within, uh, within, a, within a reasonable time period with the plan, as, as indicated in the handouts, to be um, open September of 24. Somerset Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. That's certainly good news. I know you say that the decision of what services would be in the building has been completed. That's wonderful news. I don't know if you have any information on that for me because the folks who worked at the Harborside Clinic were really interested in being part of the discussion on um, what services were going to be included, and I don't know where that ever landed. Yeah, no, I, I don't have that here specifically with the capital project. It, it's an, an excellent discussion, and I don't want to kind of push it off to the operating budget, but it's definitely an operating because it, it is staff, it is kind of uh, people um, and supplies and services. Um, so that, that is the more appropriate, I, I'd just be guessing, as to what exact precise services are going in there. Somerset Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. It's fair enough for you to say I should have a go with the health minister on that one, and no problem. <laughs> Definitely can. <laughs> Curious, we currently have it listed as 2024-2025, you had said, which is only a couple of years away. Does that look realistic at this point? I people in Somerset are definitely asking me this. So. Yeah, no, um, you know, we, having been here several times talking about community health centers, um, I was made sure that um, Health PEI had provided, uh, you know, up-to-date information based on uh, the plan today. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that if I'm back here next year talking about this project that I won't have a different story for you, but uh, this is, like I say, it's the best information that we have today. Somerset Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I also hope that, Gordon. I don't have any further questions on this particular topic, so thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, Chair, I um, just want to ask uh, the Minister, I know you're, you're new into this role, as you said before, and um, how, much, how much weight was given to um, the official opposition and the third party's involvement in the capital budget submission? Actually, should have that number of how many that we addressed. Yeah, I didn't the hear requests. Um, it was seventy percent of them, yeah, I think. I and so, the, you know, the, the process that we used, and I mean, no. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm just going off the top of my head, yeah, but uh, the, um, you know, the request had gone out. Uh, the submissions were received. We we pushed the actual in, information out to the departments for their kind of response. Um, there was uh, a number that were reoccurring items over the years, so um, the items that had been included or were included um, were, are in the budget. Those that were not included last year tended not to be in again this year. There were a couple of items that were deemed to be more operating in nature, even though they were showed up in the capital budget request and, um, and, and wouldn't be addressed through this process. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty. <clears throat> yeah, and I asked it because I noticed that you didn't have it in your speech, and every year it's in the speech. But I, I would dis I would, uh, seventy percent. It's difficult because, like, I, I'd put in things about specific transitional housing in different areas, but then you come up with three hundred and fifty-six houses. So I'm just like, it's it, it, it's it's a it's a difference. It's a difference. But anyway, I want to focus on one in particular um, that that I put in as a priority. Um, and it has, it has to do with restorative care. Um, is there anything in this budget for restorative care beds? Let me see if I can find what the Department of Health PEI said about restorative care beds. Oh, good. I can't wait to hear this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, they, they really haven't provided a specific answer as to 
where what happened to the service and, and what's their plans for it. Charlottetown West Royalty. And you see, this is this is the problem because you're, you're at seventy percent, but but I don't know if those how how you came to those numbers because the restorative care unit in at, at PE Home was gutted. It was gutted. It was taken out. It was removed. It was under the cloak of darkness. It's not there anymore. Restorative care provides Islanders with exactly what you think it is, restorative care, after they've had procedures, after they've had maybe a little bit of time in the hospital, to remove them at, uh, from that area and provide them with restorative care. We only have them in Summerside because the beds at PE Home were gutted and replaced with important dementia beds. Okay, so those are important, but you cannot, you cannot put a, 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 both of those are incredibly important. So what I'm saying is, when it says in the speech from the throne, our restorative care program will all be expanded and enhanced, that is a contradiction. So I ask again, why didn't, if, if that was my request to the minister, to the departments, that there's nothing in the book from Health PEI and restorative care? Uh, the one, the one thing that I, that I will add um, within the capital budget, there is a uh, uh, allotment or some to uh, reinvigorate the um, master planning for the QEH. So again, it was last updated about ten years ago, um, and it's another kind of process that they use to say what's the state of the hospital today, what's the state that we need to be over the next period of time. Uh, I think the last time that uh, the functional plan and the master program was updated, there was improvements to the ER, there was a third linear accelerator bunker went in, so I could point to that, that they would be considering those sorts of things as they look forward into services for the residents. Charlottetown, what's royalty? And I just think it's, there's got to be a will here for government to look at this because this is this is health promotion. This is knee, knee replacement goes a little bit complicated, and a lot of families know this goes a little bit complicated. They they need that assistance from physios, OTs, occupational therapists to to help them out, and that's where restorative care comes in. I just don't understand how the biggest budget in the in the history of Prince Edward Island, the capital budget, can miss something about because I asked for I asked for twelve beds at the PE home for a restorative care. I, I just asked you to put back in the the stock that was taken out. So that might at this point it might mean an expansion onto PE home. Is an expansion onto PE home something that you talked about to return these twelve beds into service? There's no expansion of PE home planned today. Um, I would assume that the, the department and health PEI looks at the service that is being utilized out there as an important service as well, as you had indicated. Um, um, I would, would hope that um, when the, the next round of planning goes on at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, that they'll take a look at all the services that need to be there and restorative care, if, if, if kind of has the patient load that uh, you're indicating, yeah. would be one of the ones that they would consider. Charlottetown West Royalty. And then that brings me to my next set of questions. So if during the pandemic we had an increasing amount of people that, that were in the hospital with dementia and that's why they went over because the surgeries were cancelled so they took that wing out for COVID purposes and now it's a dementia wing. So it's not, it's, it's going to remain there because of the need for dementia. For, for dementia beds in Prince Edward Island, which is increasing. That was a, maybe a stopgap mechanism. Is there anything in the capital budget that's allocating for more dementia beds in Prince Edward Island? Um, I'm not an expert on bed utilization within the long-term care sector by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I, I am aware that it, it is an, an iterative process as because a person comes today at a certain level of care, they don't remain at that level of care, so there is a, a constant kind of, um, not movement of people, but a realignment of services for the services that are needed. Um, so on a day by day, week by week, that, that is evolving all the time. So I think within the long-term care sp uh, sphere that, um, you know, what is the next investment? It, it's not within here right now, um, but I suspect it'll come down the road if if, if the, the need is further demonstrated. 
Charles Thomas Royalty. And I appreciate you answering these, Gordon. These are these are tough questions that 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 you know I'm just looking at. We we need a capital program for that because it's 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 getting worse. And and I think my examples have shown that that's why these are some of the reasons that when we're asking these questions, why we have to look at at maybe not voting for uh, a budget like this because something as simple as 12 units that were taken out of the system were never replaced and in the speech from the throne it said our government's going to expand and enhance that so i'm i'm going to have to think about those things thank you chair i appreciate the time leader of the opposition thanks chair um i'd like to uh, within this section uh, look at the midwifery spending which is happening at the queen's community Queen's County Community Health Centre. And I guess the first question is, because I know that recently the positions were advertised, I believe it was for four midwives and one program director or program lead, um, and the deadline for applying for that was November the 17th. And I see in the, in the budget here it says anticipated occupancy winter 2023. So does winter 2023 mean January, February 23 or December 2023? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sure. I'm sorry, what was the answer? Oh, God, I would imagine it was it'd be based on being able to fill those positions. I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge to fill them, so I would assume as soon as they can fill them that, that that's a key component to delivering that program is, is to fill in those positions. So, yeah, your answer is... You, you, uh, I would say it's dependent on, on, the, on the filling of those positions. Leader of the opposition. Right. We've had so many due dates for this delivery that it's uh, it's become uh, mind-boggling. And here we go again. I, I just uh, I, I'm, 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 I guess I'll ask the same question in a different way. What what is the due date for delivery of midwifery services on Prince Edward Island? Um, I, I don't have the information on the service side of it. I, I think they're, they were looking at um, kind of <coughs> updating the building, uh, building here in Charlottetown. I think it's out at the Mount is, is the location that they're talking about. Um, so I, you know, th this particular budget would ensure that the leaseholds are, are appropriate for the service when it starts. I, I'll attempt to try to get a date for you when uh, you say winter 2023 is broad. I, I would suspect it's before the end of March. Um, because again, it's uh, but again, the, there is funding in 23 24 for this as well, so it could be the next runaround. But I, I'll try to get that date for you, leader of the opposition. Thanks, chair. And I, I want to say at this point that uh, the depth and breadth of your knowledge on every question that's come your way, Gordon, is absolutely astonishing. <laughs> and uh, yeah. We're asking detailed questions on the full range of government expenditure, and the fact that you that you're able to answer as you are is, is fantastic, and I'm very very grateful for that. However, Chair, always <laughs> <laughs> um, a It would be, and I know we're following the conventional practice of this legislature in the way that we're conducting ourselves in this capital budget review, as we do in the operational review, though they're different. But I mean it. These sorts of questions, we shouldn't expect Gordon to be able to answer that level of question. It's just not fair. Um, it would be, however, I would expect the minister or the deputy minister for this department to be able to do that. And it's frustrating for me, and it's frustrating for, in this case, island women who have been waiting for a very, 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 very long time for, for this to happen, not to have that very basic question answered. Um, so, again, Gordon, this is no reflection on you. I am astonished at how much you can tell us, but it's, a, it's an official complaint about the, the process that we're, that we're operating here, and I really hope we can get our heads together collectively and come up with a better way of doing this. For, we both sit on legislative yep. management. Maybe Let's that's a possibility. Let's do that, Chair. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Okay, okay back, to the, back to the issue at hand here. Uh, Gordon, you mentioned the Mount as the, uh, the place where the the midwifery program is going to be located. Uh, can you give us some more details on what that might look like? Uh, not really. Um, I know that there is um, the, the... You've been in on this before, so you know it's a couple of <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, I, I don't have any specific design elements on what's going in the building. I just okay. kind of have, there's some renovations that are needed for the space that will be required 
um, based on the base building that's there today. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. So if I, if I look at the spending for this, um, I see that, uh, where is it? Yeah, the design for midwifery design is in progress. I'm, I suspect there's a typo there because yeah, what one one design probably is sufficient. <laughs> uh, but the the design. So are we at the design stage here, or if we well, are shovels in the ground? Well, the, the good news there's a building there. The Mount does have a building. It was configured for a particular service. That's not this service. Right. Um, so I suspect they're putting exam rooms and meeting spaces and, and office space for um, the layout of a three or four person um, kind of service. And I expect that's what's happening there, but I'm only speculating, so I can get some details for right. sure. Right. Leader of the Opposition. Again, I apologize for asking these detailed questions to you, Gordon. Um, so has the leasehold improvement, which is budgeted here at $3 million for 23-24, is, is that's for whatever needs to be done to make the, that space, as you say, it wasn't originally built to be a midwifery um, centre. And I mean, I've been in birthing centres, uh, and there are very, very specific requirements for, for a modern operating birthing centre, which I presume is what these midwifery centres are going to look like. Um, and that's not something that you can spin up in a couple of months. So. I'm wondering whether the work on that has actually started yet, the physical work? The physical work? Um, let's see what I have here. Uh, the physical work has not started. They're currently finalizing the design. Um, the expected occupancy, if I have just kept on reading, um, is February or March 2023. So that answers one of the questions. It's not December of 23. Um, Leader of the opposition. Okay, that's uh, that's kind of mm -hmm. extraordinarily um, <laughs> not vague so much as uh, uh, ambitious. Uh, sure. You know, here we are, mid-November, yep. and we haven't even started the renovations. And you're saying that, uh, or at least the document you're citing there is saying well, that, that we're like going to. said, at the end of the day, the, the the building is there, the, 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 sure. system, the yeah. air handling systems and all the stuff that would have a lot of lead time, um, I suspect, is already within the building. Um, so, again, I'm just going by what I've been advised and what is part of the information that that, uh, that I have with me here today. But I can definitely promise to clarify some of that, and, and that I will. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, so, I mean, it looks to me like we're looking at further delays to the gestation period here and that this will not be delivered in <laughs> spring. I mean, I'll be generous and call it even spring if we're going to go as far as March. I just, I just practically cannot see how government could do that. And I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of being realistic in, in our plans and in our goals and in our promises, particularly our promises. And um, I, I, well, maybe, I, you know, once the minute we have another question here, and the minister is back on the floor. Maybe I'll be able to sure. ask some of these more detailed questions. But uh, uh, again, I appreciate your the, the amount of information you're able to give to us, Gordon. I do have a couple more questions sure. on this yeah. section, yeah. Chair. Um, we're talking here, and as far as I can see, all of the capital expenditures related to providing facilities for midwives is in Queens County at the at the Mount. Is that correct? I was. Just reading something on this, I think it's a phased-in approach. The first phase is in the Charlottetown area. The second phase was planned for Summerside, so um, they're going to try to get Phase One up and running with a complement of staff, as the minister indicated. Uh, you indicated that the postings are out, and hopefully, we'll have a building for them to work in if, if indeed we can get them here. Um, but um, I think the Phase Two was planned for the East Prince Summerside area. Leader of the opposition and. You know, don't get me wrong, I am cheering that we finally have, we're the, this is the furthest along we've ever been when it comes to, to uh, actually providing midwifery services for island women. Um, and I, you know, I can't wait for this to happen and I know that there are people who have delayed moving to Prince Edward Island because they could not receive midwifery services here and this has been a very long time coming so I, I can't wait for it to happen and I, I don't want my 
questions here to be construed as criticism. Not at all. I'm, I'm delighted this is happening. I just wish it had happened three years ago when it was first promised. But one of the uh, requirements for home deliveries, and that is a very large part of what midwives do, one of the services they provide, both the, the prepartum the delivery and the postpartum care. But the option of having a home delivery, which I, I imagine has never happened other than in a, an un unexpected emergency year on PEI and maybe back, well, of course, back in the old days, that was the way, that was the way all islanders came into the world. But these days, it's been a long time since we've had home deliveries available. You have to be within 30 minutes of uh, a centre um, for safety reasons because things can sometimes not go as planned. So if phase one is in Charlottetown and we have five positions that, we have, that we've just um, advertised, I'm assuming all of those positions will be dedicated to Charlottetown since we haven't got anything in the capital budget for any facilities elsewhere in the province. That means that anybody more than 30 minutes away from Charlottetown is actually going to be denied the option of a home birth through a midwife for at least the foreseeable future because they're going to be outside that safe zone which regulation prevents them from having. Is that, is that correct? Um, you're pretty deep into the <laughs> operational <laughs> area of midwifery, which is definitely beyond my uh, area of expertise. Fair. That, that's absolutely yeah. fair. Leader of the opposition? That's absolutely fair, Gordon, and I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I, think I've, I think I've dug down far enough in this. Okay. I, uh, again, I'm excited that this is coming after many, many years, and I, I appreciate the information you were able to give us, and I look forward to further announcements and, and perhaps more information through other means in this house in the in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. You're welcome. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I was just interested in the conversation where you say that there was 70% of projects. Our capital ask was pretty straightforward. It was we asked for all of the past three submissions to be actually included in the capital budget. So um, we didn't, you know, build on that because we feel like what we, what we had requested in the previous years, things like the restorative care um, at, and to put it at QEH, but if it was to go to Prince Edward Home, good. Um, expansion of de detox services and facilities in Summerside, I think that we can all agree that that's something that was very important. And then air conditioning at Hillsborough Hospital. So I want to go to the ventilation upgrade section, and uh, you've provided quite a bit of detail in the, in the capital repair section uh, under this. So I'm going to touch on, cap, on ventilation upgrades first, and then I'm going to go to the generator. So um, what is the long-term care cooling project referred to in the, in the uh, handout? Is that something new, or is that something that has been in the works for a little while? Uh, that's a new item in the capital budget. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And so that's a two-year program, it looks like. Yes. Um, and how were the specific homes chosen? Because it looks like O'Leary and Tyne Valley are not part of the program. Does that mean that they have a, um, already have a cooling unit that is sufficient? Um, I can't comment about O'Leary, but Tyne Valley is a newer building that has some cooling capacity already built into it. Um, um, and this, when I was kind of beefing up or reading up on, on this particular, um, it, it's, it's twofold. It, it's for staff and for residents. Um, there's very, as I mentioned the other, the other day, I think dehumidification is probably the biggest issue for residents. It's not necessarily the absolute temperature, but there's staff areas, whether it be in the kitchens or break rooms or common areas that um, they don't get a break throughout their shift. And mm -hmm. I think the, the plan is to try to get some some cool areas within these facilities uh, for staff. Uh, Mermaid Stratford. I see that as a very important yep. thing to have to ensure that people have a um, a work environment that is comfortable for them to work in. And I I know that some of these rooms get extremely warm, and you can just imagine like the building as a whole would be um, uncomfortable to work in. So with the ventilation upgrades, there's QEH, um, um, air handling units, there's Beach Grove, Manor, Wedgwood Manor, Hos Surrey Hospital, 
I don't see any reference to Hillsboro Hospital, and that's been something that we've been asking for for a number of years. Can you tell me if ventilation has been upgraded in the Hillsboro Hospital? And if not, how come it's not a priority? Um, we are going to get we are getting a new building, and I know that's not a, a good reason not not to have um, um, the, the the safe uh, environment that that is required. Uh, there has been some um, single units placed in where they could put the units. It, it is an old building that um, with, that has challenging uh, kind of workflow and airflow in it. Um, this particular uh, project was um, part of the. Um, the, it was part of the ICIP ventilation upgrade, so we had to submit a number with, with a sort of a, a, let's say, a pocket or a, a group of funding that was available through our um, ICIP, um, the Invest in Canada Infrastructure Program um, ventilation kind of offshoot. Um, so they kind of come up with a number of projects that would kind of aid and benefit the system and would fit also the, the, the profile of, of, of funds that were available. Mayor Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I guess um, it's challenge, challenging. Like, Hillsborough Hospital seems to be have left off the list because we're going to be doing a new capital project and building a new hospital. But, you know, similar to KCMH, which is probably a decade away. I'm wondering if the if the MLA for the area will be the same age as maybe the Charlottetown Brighton by the time that we see that. <laughs> but um, at this point in time, I can't believe that we wouldn't be doing capital upgrades within a facility when we know that it's years away before it's actually built. So I'm surprised by that. Um, sorry, I guess there's not a there? question there. Maybe okay. that's just a statement. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, I would just like to touch on the Nursing Home Association of PEI and a report that they had um, submitted to the Committee of Health and Social Development requesting an increase to the, their capital repairs budget. Um, was this increase granted for their capital repairs? Um, the funding that we provide to the Nursing Home Association would be a grant through the operating budget. So we don't own those buildings. Mayor Wright Stratford. Okay, thank you. And the um, so the ventilation that is budgeted for a couple of long-term care homes and hospitals. Do they um, do all other long-term care homes and hospitals have full and appropriate ventilation? So any of the ones that are not on the list. Um, I, I don't have an assessment for for all the buildings. Mayor Wright Stratford. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, so let's talk about the Health PEI Charlottetown office. It was flooded on both floors. A lot of damage done to that building, and it was closed for uh, quite a period of time. So do you know how much spe was spent on to repair the damage in that building? Um, that, that building is, is a lease for government, and the, the, land, the landlords are currently undertaking that. I okay. don't have any line of sight as to what their cost will be. Okay. We, we have a lease with them that has been abated while we're not in the building. Um, so they're trying to get that building put back together as fast as they can okay. to get the staff back in. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And then I just have another one more question on this, I think. Um, so there was reports that there was a lot of file damages um, as a result of that flooding. And given the considerable investments into IT, what I'm wondering an IT investment would be in the capital budget. Is there a need for IT investments to protect against physical files being damaged again? And is that in this current budget? Um, uh, records management is, is part of the responsibilities of uh, education and early learning. So they're, they're working with all areas to both look after the paper and, and the digitizing of, of files. So that the process is ongoing. Um, I'm not aware of what files were, were damaged. I, I don't believe there's any patient records per se at Garfield Street. Um, it would be more staff staff files, um, in, uh, documents under their staff's possession. Mayor Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I mean, I, I think that would be important if we had 
physical files that had been damaged because of flooding, that really signals the how important it is to ensure electronic records are um, up, put into effect in all areas. And I did say that was my last question, but it wasn't. I forgot to ask my generators. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask, there's um, almost $1.5 million spent this year with no budget, and I'm assuming that's because of Fiona. But can you tell me where um, what generators were purchased and where were they where they were put? I think there's one in two weeks going to the Beach Grove home, um, as I'm aware. Two weeks? I think it's two weeks. I was talking to the staff over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, now I, I, there is a generator at the Beach Grove home. It, it's in a replacement and an upgrade to that particular one. Um, the information that I had related to generators, again, was more um, the spending, I think it was in the previous budget but we were having supply chain issues and actually securing the actual units. So um, this was more of a pickup of a past plan. I'm trying to get to where the actual units are being installed, but you probably have it on your page faster than I'm going to find it here. Stratford. I appreciate that. And something of interest throughout Fiona, what we found out, was a lot of private long-term care homes and community care homes actually had generators in place and were and provided very well throughout the storm to ensure that residents were safe. Do you know what long-term care homes, if there was any private long-term care homes or community care facilities that did not have generators? And is there a plan to ensure that that is something that that needs to be um, updated in the up, in the new agreements with them? You almost said in the operating budget. No upcoming oh, agreements uh, with them no. because they've been outstanding well, again, for that, two that, years. That just to point that of, out, that would be part of the operating budget. Okay, it, it's a grant to them if for Mayor Stratford items and needs that uh, are required for the private long-term care. Okay, thank you, Gordon. And then my final question would be, do we, no, I think this one is it. <laughs> I think so. My, um, right, given what we know now after Fiona, I would certainly hope that we could all agree in this legislative assembly that no public long-term care home or health care facility should go without a generator. And so... Do we have anything forecasted in the upcoming year to ensure that every healthcare facility in Prince Edward Island has a generator? Um, I think that that'll be part of the review that comes out of what went well and what didn't go well. Um, I'm not aware of where we do and do not have, have generated, generator capacity. I know um, coming up in, in transportation and infrastructure there is a number that will be planned for some buildings so we'll try to gather some information ahead of that particular section. Mermaid Stratford, your I'm fourth good. last question? No, I think that was actually my actual last question okay. for this for this section. Okay. <laughs> Shall the section carry? Yeah. Total capital expenditure health PEI fifty one million six hundred and eleven thousand three hundred. Shall carry? carry. Page 21, capital expenditure, justice and public safety, 2023-2024 budget estimate equipment. Appropriations provided for information technology, purchases, system modernizations and equipment. Equipment, 355,000. IT system modernization, 3,457,200. Total equipment, 3,812,200. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So there's, um, there's a big drop off in the funding for vital statistics. Can you walk us through why we have that drop off? Um, yeah, the vital statistics system um, has been going through a little bit of an upgrade over the past number of years. Um, so we completed one of the upgrades and there's another upgrade kind of being planned right now. Um, we work with uh, kind of the, the federal government and the provincial kind of partners to, to ensure that we're collecting the same information um, at the same level um, and 
that's we require system upgrades from from time to time. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Thanks, Chair. I'm trying to get my papers in order to okay. switch sections. So the inc the increase in funding in equipment twenty um, for 2024-2025. What's the increase for? Um, Yeah, the, the, the biggest part of that is. Um, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, the biggest part of that is, is, is some equipment for the emergency measures office, um, having been field tested quite robustly over the past number of weeks, um, with the out and the effects of uh, Hurricane uh, Fiona, they, they require some additional uh, equipment at the the MO office and carry out uh, carry out the work. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. And so under the IT system um, modernization, that's a huge increase. Can you tell me what is planned for the for this current um, budget year? And just before I finish that question, do is there there yeah. is there a handout? Okay. Is it new has it already been handed out? No. Oh. I, I jinxed myself. I'm so. Oh, you, you did? Because I'm, I'm I'm flipping through my pages. It was all ready to go yesterday, and we just spent the whole day on having fun. Oh yes. Okay. Is there a handout? Yeah, there, it's okay. being copied there now. Okay. okay. It's being copied, it will yeah. be distributed. So, Mermaid Stratford, you had the floor. Okay. I'm just my. I that would probably give me a lot of detail on sure. what this huge increase is. I'm wondering if we could take a short recess till we have them. Oh. Yeah, I can move on. I'll move okay. on. Cheryl, I want royalty. Um, yeah, so the, uh, we're about uh, the, the equi I'm on the equipment line for, for from $75,000 to $355,000. That would be the equipment for EMO. That's, that's the line? That, that would be the big part of the increase. We wouldn't have had a budget established for them last year. We have a one-time kind of upgrade to the office, um, some... video conferencing equipment and, and some other equipment, the radios and things like that, that they're going to be required to more effectively uh, do the work up there. Sure, I'll West Royalty. Shouldn't, shouldn't we have known that after Dorian and the Callion report? I, I, I don't believe that the office uh, during Dorian got nearly, the, I would say, the workout um, that, that it did during Fiona for sure. Um, the storm was larger and longer lasting and um, so they as being through the the process for the many days and, and, and the weeks that were were in operation up there um, they further tested and, and required some upgrades and enhancements Cheryl, I was royalty. so that line and that much money how much money was put into that line post Fiona because there was time the whole amount so 355,000? No, 200,000 for EMO was put into that line in the preparation. It was not there before wow. last year, and it, 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 it's for a one year upgrade. Sure, I'll tell what's wrong with it. So, is, is that communication to communicate from EMO to Islanders or from EMO to EMO? Uh, it would be. EMO and the many partners that they are required to deal with uh, on a regular basis, whether that be police, fire, um, uh, municipalities, uh, the federal government, um, all the all the people that were involved with the uh, the uh, the activities post uh, post Fiona. Charlton, what's royalty? It's just baffling because did we get the equipment in already? So we we, put, we ordered no. it as the equipment here. It's a 23-24 budget, so it would be planned to be going in over the next year. Sure, I'll tell what's wrong with Because in the Fiona report, which I have, it's 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 talking about communications being a major gap, and then we're just finding out we ordered two two hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment after Fiona. I mean, we we, you know, I'm just trying to figure out. Were we ready or not? Because in the in the Dorn report, it says that we weren't ready to communicate within each other, and that was a major problem. Yep, there were there were significant in, improvements to um, to the they call it the PICS radio system. That's an island wide 
communication system. So um, within this line as well, there is a continued investment in that system. Um, they identified that the, um, I think when the ferry was on fire in, uh, in, in uh, Murray, Wood Island. Island, thank you, thank you, <laughs> um, that there was uh, many agencies on scene there that, uh, that were having trouble communicating as well, so I think they, they saw some of the, uh, the benefits from, from having some additional uh, technology that was further kind of highlighted through the, the, um, the event of Fiona. So is this money is going to be top, top loaded or, or spent immediately to get those systems updated or is it because this is a five year capital budget so is it yeah. that's immediate money is it? Uh, as immediate as I guess the more immediate as they could secure and procure it today they would have had it in the forecast for 22-23 but I think they're going to take a more thoughtful approach and, and kind of plan and, and, and get the equipment and the design and, and in, into place for for the for the offices as required on a go forward basis. Charlottetown, what's wrong to? We heard from EMO uh, when they were speaking to uh, the standing committee on health. We heard that they um, they quickly during Fiona they quickly outpaced their existing space. Um, so they they actually took over another floor. They said so they had their original floor and then their top floor. If you're able to give them two hundred thousand dollars for for radios, are you? Were you just radios? Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm being yeah. I mean, just for for additional equipment that we what we need for the next time, which is going to be good that we had it, or that we have it. What are we doing? What's in the capital budget for space requirements moving forward for EMO? Um, yeah, they've been at the fifth floor of the Royal Trust Tower for many years, and they used to joint occupy that space with the federal government. The federal government has since moved out of it, so we have accessed more space. Um, it, it, it's a tough uh, sort of, you never want to put your space in, at the level that you needed for that one day event, or that one week event, or that one month event, because now I have to lease it for the next five years or two years till it comes along. So. I, you know, I think it was um, it was great that there was space available. I think they'll be looking at having agreements in place so they don't have to hope that um, that that space would be available for them. That will be part of their plan as to how do we ramp up and then ramp back down when the emergency is not um, right in the middle of, of taking place. Charlton, what's wrong? Before, if Fiona didn't hit. Would there have been any money for these radios and equipment? Uh, there, there is a line regularly for the, the PIX-2. It's about $75,000, so we are kind of regularly um, enhancing and upgrading that system. Um, but again, this was for the whole service for the EMO operations. Radios would be part of it. Uh, video conferencing and, and some of that technology uh, is going to be part of it. Um, and I suspect a few other things, but... Uh, Charlottetown, what's royalty? And then, is, is the necessary steps there? You know, they're on the, the fifth floor. Do they, I'm just thinking if the power goes out. We've heard, like, we didn't understand what it would be like for an, an, a power outage of this magnitude across the province. Uh, the EMO office being on the fifth floor, are they fully equipped with generators? Are they, are they able to, you mentioned video conferencing. Well, I, I don't assume video conferencing would really necessarily work during a complete power outage. Like, have we, wh where are we on that? Because that location would be hard to get generation power up there. So have we, are we? Yeah, there's, really there's generation for that particular space, absolutely. That's one of the requirements to have your EMO office. Um, on so the roof, probably. Not, yeah. Yeah. Charles, how much royalty? Um, I'll have more questions. I'll pass it to the floor. And come Time up. Valley, sure book. Uh, radios. So um, uh, it's good to see increased investment in this. One of the things I understood was that not only did it, the system not work as well as it needed to, there also just simply weren't enough radios. Um, so when we have a storm as severe as Fiona, you know, we're seeing situations where 
roads might be blocked off by trees between sort of two different fire departments or two areas that are covered and they need to be able to every truck really needs to be able to communicate uh, clearly so you know will every fire truck will there be enough here for every truck on the island to have a radio or how is that going to work um yeah that, it, it, it's a constant uh, kind of upgrade and evolution for all the member departments that serve again they are community-based groups that have community budgets available to them. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the city of Summerside and, and Charlottetown have their own communications within, so um, they don't all the time rely on the PICS too because they're dealing with their own municipalities. So um, I think there, there was an announcement where there was a number of radios that were kind of uh, pushed out through the PEI Firefighters Association to uh, member, member departments. Um, so I, I think that it was highlighted and I think that uh, we'll be working towards uh, ensuring that those that need them will have them. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, so that all sounds really good, but it, it doesn't, uh, didn't actually answer the question of will every, every truck have one. And I think, you know, when you're thinking about uh, our, you know, volunteer firefighters, as you say, it's, you know, community-based uh, volunteers that are just out there helping their community. You know, if you're out in the dark on a, stormy night like Fiona I mean to not have access to that information it's we certainly want them to have as much information as possible to keep themselves and everybody safe so I guess you know it's good to hear everybody who needs them will have them from what I'm hearing every truck needs them so is that what you're saying that every fire truck will have a PIX radio yeah I'll, I'll have to get the kind of reconciliation of how many trucks are out there and how many radios are out there. I don't have that here today, but I'll try to find that for you. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. That's it uh, for me, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Great, thanks, Chair. Um, and thank you, Gordon, for the handouts. It's very, it's very helpful. Um, so 900,000 over five years for the 911 system upgrades. Can you tell me uh, more about those system upgrades? Like, are they to do with Medicom or what is this in particular? Um, it, yeah, I think it is a system, the island-wide system for, for 911. Uh, Medicom is one of the users along with um, sort of every islander and uh, the agencies that are, are providing the service. Um, I think the, the upgrades that are being planned is uh, continuing the, the rollout of the, they call it the next generation 911, um, trying to have uh, text and be able to text to 911, um, the ability to send video and pictures, so just future, future enhancements to the system as, as technology improves. Mermaid Stratford. Great, okay, thanks, Chair. And my understanding, it's Medicom, I believe it's um, City of Charlottetown, um, they ma manage their own 911 calls. Is there any other entities that manages 911 calls for the province? Um, Med Medicom is the primary receiver of the 911 calls. Yeah. Um, they do the dispatching to the city of Charlottetown and to the city of Summerside. They do the dispatching to Island EMS um, and the RCMP. So Medicom oh, is the primary dispatcher. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thanks, Chair. And so does all of the, this technology go into the Medicom office? Or is there some results that the system is housed? Because I know that there's a backup location at the EMS building in Stratford. Uh, for sure, but the, the 911 system is, is the, right now the land, land lay, landline based and cell phone based yeah. system that the telecoms are kind of running and we're right. kind of paying for. Yeah. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thanks, Chair. But, but the description of it makes it sound like it's the equipment for the users of the 911 system to be able to do texting and that kind of thing. Well, it would be the users, me calling as well as the I'm, I'm using Oh, I, call, I see right? what you mean. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it would both allow side, the users sides. calling 911 to be able to do texting and that kind of thing instead. And potential pictures transfer and, and things oh. like that of what they see um, at the scene at some point. Oh, that's okay. interesting. Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Is there, and I imagine you're going to tell me this is operational, but I'm not so sure it is because usually when you're implementing new system, you, training comes with that. 
and that's included in uh, the rollout and the capital expense. So is there some sort of training um, that you foresee would be required in order to let Islanders know that this is now, or communications program that that is for, to roll it out to Islanders? And when, do, when is it expected to be up and running? Because this says over five years. Does yeah, that mean we no, can't implement in five years? Um, I, I don't know when the project starts and ends. It, it's a continuous upgrade. Uh, you, you did kind of indicate, and I will agree with you, that uh, there is a 911 section within the Department of Justice and Public Safety that is responsible for this service, and uh, they'd be the ones that would be uh, controlling the messaging and, and the information that would go out to the, to the public, um, whether or not Medicom needs specific training. I don't, that would be more of an operational in nature that mm -hmm. they would gather through the contract with the province. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. That's I look forward to finding out more about that as it starts to roll out. Um, I'd like to talk about the vital stats system, and this um, is $1.4 million in the upcoming year, um, and it's the new system to modernize the birth, marriage, and death registration process. Is there um, a piece of this? So I'm going to tell you this from a personal perspective. When my father passed away, um, after a certain amount of time, my mom could no longer go and get his death certificate in Charlottetown. She had to travel to Montague um, in order to get access to that certificate. That It's difficult when you have somebody who can't readily travel, um, but she had to go down and verify herself. Is, is this going to be an online process where people can actually access these um, these certificates more readily available, like six months after um, this, like a death occurs or a year after. Is it going to be online? Uh, man, I, I think that's kind of the goal of, of my PPI, as when we talked about it in the ITSS section, is to have kind of a front end process that you can identify yourself, of which this then would interface as a service underneath it. So. This would be one of many, I suspect, services that we're hoping to push out online. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Oh, hello, Chair. <laughs> Deeper voice. <laughs> Shaved. Hello, Mermaid Stratford. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, True. I lost my train of thought. So, <laughs> um, this update will facilitate the streamlining of current online services while providing more streamlined services to individuals. So is there a detailed, usually when you implement new IT programs, there it comes with a, like an implementation um, plan of how you're going to put this into the system and then how you're going to get all of the old information into that system so that all of the um, historical records can be accessed. Is it anticipated that that's all going to be done within one year? Um. I, I suspect that the, the, the cost of, that's contained in the budget is the actual program or the, the, the item that we're buying, okay. the actual work plan to get all the records and data transferred would be part of more of an operational how they go forward. And you, you build the system, you turn it on, that's the thing that we're actually bought. Okay. So the actual capitalizing, capitalizing the, the system, as the minister said, but the actual uploading the new transactions, well, that's just part of, of the, turning the new system on. Um, kind of linking the data back would be part of it, for sure, in the overall capital. So I'm not sure if that's scanning, but it would all be part and parcel. Once you okay. Turn, turn key. Okay. I think that Mermaid covers... Stratford? I think that covers my questions. Thank you, Chair. Perfect. Thank you. Summerside, Wilma. <laughs> Uh, questions for you, Gordon. On the EMO emergency preparedness money, there's $205,000 here. Is this in response to Fiona, or was this a planned upgrade already? Uh, no, I, we, we did have a little conversation oh, while I'm you sorry, were in the room, but the uh, room, it was definitely that. one of the items that, um, while we were kind of in the final throes of the capital budget preparation, the department came forward with some early identified needs that of things that could go better if they had a capital investment. Yeah. So um, that amount was allocated uh, to the budget to help them uh, improve uh, improve the processes up there. 
Somerset Wilmot. Thank you, Chair, and my apologies for having missed that, Gordon. When I read through what's provided here, it says funding is targeted to EMO operations for logistics and communications to ensure redundancy and options dependent on the event, but that really doesn't give me a clear picture of what we're talking about. If you've already clarified that, yeah. it's my sincere apology that I'm asking you to do so again. Uh, they're, they're planning for some video conferencing upgrades within the operations centre. Um, additional PIX2 radios. Um, uh, within here, they want to purchase two drones um, for post-damage post assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's it. Those all sound like good investments. So, no Summerside further, Wilmot? No further questions on that part. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total equipment, $3,812,200. Shall the section carry? Uh, capital improvements, appropriations provided for capital improvements to properties. Capital repairs, $930,000. Uh, Correctional Center, Women's Unit, $20,200. Are there any questions? Summerside Wilmot? Thank you, Chair. Um, the capital repairs have nearly tripled from last year's budget. So it looks like you've highlighted a couple of things that that's going to be, but is this the bulk of that extra money, these four projects? Uh, yes. Summerside Wilmot? No, just the four projects that are laid out in the, in the, in the notes. Sorry. Summerside Wilmot? Thank you, Chair. I was curious if any of the capital repairs were related to damage from Fiona, but it doesn't sound like yeah, I, I, I think they fared out reasonably well. Um, as anyone could fare out in, 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 in the event, for sure. Um, so there wasn't, and again, that whole process is under being undertaken with, with the insurance as well. So if there were repairs um, that were caused because of Fiona, um, we, we would have insurance coverage that uh, would be looking first um, to make any in repairs as needed. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I noticed that in the fiscal for 2023-2024, the capital improvements are expected to increase. I'm just wondering if you can give me a sense of the longer term plan for capital investments for PEI facilities. Um, the, well, the big long term over is, is the planned uh, facility in Summerside at the tail end of the capital program, and that's the next big uh, capital build for, for this department. Um, we're just coming off a fairly major addition out at the uh, Sleepy Hollow for, for, the, for the women's unit that mm -hmm. is approaching completion and ready for commissioning. Um, so it's, it's really those two projects that are, that are driving the majority of the costs. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Do you happen to, I don't think it's in this, but do you know how many people will be able to be accommodated at the women's center? Oh dear. Um, I'd have to bring that back to you unless I can quickly. I'll see if I can find it here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Summerside Wilma? I think that's good for me on this section. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlotte Homeless Royalty. Uh, here. Um, so the provincial. The, the women's uh, correctional center that like we, we talked about COVID, we talked about ventilation. Then this, the it was built. Is that being um, built with up to date ventilation? Is that the ventilation that went in there? Is yes, top notch. Charles, how much royalty? Okay, um, the, for the provincial <coughs> correctional center, um, one point seven million over five years. It says infrastructure to ensure the building remains safe. What what is what like how? Yeah, safe and, for who? And it's an interesting choice of words for sure um, <laughs> yeah. for a correctional facility. Yeah. Um, but as with all the the um, departments that have facilities, there is an ongoing repair and maintenance budget, and that that's what this is. So as um, wear and tear happens, as as events happen um, throughout the facility, um, they they need to have a budget to uh, mm -hmm. keep it up to. Uh, Keep it safe. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty. So then that poses the question. We've been here before in this capital budget and social development with seniors units, with with seniors it's units. Section. Well, I know it's in the okay. next section, but it's a comparison. I'm just making a comparison. So when I see the word safe and then I see the word uh, include upgrade to modernize several operational areas, is this enough funding to accomplish that? Ref is it a refurbishment or is it a... 
no. I'd call it an, an evergreening. So you have a facility that is uh, is there. We're trying to keep it kind of operational and at a certain level uh, throughout its useful life. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that's that's too that's too convincing at this time. Um, so what is Several are several operational areas. Are those what are, are those being prioritized? Are they? Uh, yes, with um, and, and we discussed this a little bit with with the health PEI facilities. Um, they put forward a budget uh, in anticipation that there will be things that need to be fixed. They they would have a list ongoing all the time of things they'd like to get done, and as the new budget comes, they attack a new list of priorities. Yeah. New items get added to the bottom of the list as you work through it, and, and that's how you kind of mm -hmm. keep a like, repairs and maintenance budget going. Yeah. Charlotte Thomas Royalty. I appreciate that. And it's just, I mean, I've been here for three years and I've watched, and I, I, I look back at my first two years and I said, maybe, maybe I should have pushed harder on renovations. I was, I thought I was pushing hard on renovations for senior so I'm the same, I'm the same here. I don't think $1.7 million is going to get that facility up and operational. I think it needs a lot more than that, but um, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be keeping the government in check for as long as as long as I can. So thank you very much Chair. Thank you. Um Charlotte Section Carrot. Carrie. Total capital improvements nine hundred and fifty thousand two uh, nine hundred and fifty thousand two hundred dollars. Shall I carry? Carrie. Total capital expenditure justice and public safety four million seven hundred sixty two thousand four hundred. Shall I carry? Carrie. We are now Turning to page 23. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is capital expenditures for social development and housing. Uh, equipment, appropriations provided for information technology purchases, uh, child protection services, $140,000. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Can you explain the spending on child protection technology and why it's less than it was last year? Um, yeah, we're, we're just coming to the conclusion of that project, so this is the last piece that we get the project completed. So there's an amount in the current forecast for the current year, 22-23. Um, can I catch up here? Uh, they're forecasting to spend 300000 this year um, against uh, a budget of 275 and another 140 to finish it off. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I know we've had a discussion in the House on a number of occasions about the idea yes. of a rental registry, but I noticed there's no uh, planned equipment spending in the next five years in the budget that I can see for any rental registry. Is it safe to say there's no plan for a government run registry in the next five years? There's there's, there's no funding in here for the development of a, a registry. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Is it possible for you to tell me if Social Development and Housing requested funding for that? Uh, I'm not aware that they, they asked for it. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I don't suppose you have a way of knowing what requests came forward that didn't get funded, eh? It, it, part of the whole iterative process is Lots of projects come forward to have a full accounting. It, it, it would be difficult for sure. All right. I don't think I have any other questions on this, Chair. Are there any other questions? Shall this action carry? Carry. Total equipment, uh, $140,000. Shall it carry? Carry. Capital improvements. Appropriations provided for capital improvements, acquisitions, and construction. Capital repairs, housing, $3,610,000. Construction, housing, $57,297,100. Capital repairs, residential services, $120,000. Construction, residential services, $3,630,000. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. First of all, can you explain to me the distinction between capital repairs for housing and capital repairs for residential services? Um, yeah, the best description that I could provide is the the housing would be more related to the housing corporation. The first part would be related to departmental spending, mostly on group homes that aren't in the housing corporation. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I see that we are more than tripling our capital expenditure for repairs on housing. Can you explain to me why we 
weren't planning to start that sort of work earlier. Why the priority on it now when it's been neglected for so long? I, I, I just don't know how to answer that question, I guess. <laughs> no one really does. That's the problem. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I suppose we have a five-year plan. And we've had a five-year plan all the way along. Is that the state of housing is significantly worse now than it was last year, or is are more requests coming in for repairs, or is there an acknowledgement of problems that have been long-standing? Well, I, I think you know part of the event that just under has, has overtaken us with, with Fiona highlighted some of the needs, um, whether it be. You know, some backup power in, in units. Uh, I know um, ventilation and, and cooling and things like that have been highlighted as issues. And I, and I think this, this budget has uh, made an attempt to try to start working at that, for sure. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I'll get back on the list later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlotte Allen, West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so there was 100 new builds in last year's capital budget. Um, planned and I think those got kind of merged in to make the number 465 from last year this year. How many of those hundred units were built last year? Um, just trying to see if you're going to have yeah we're, we're going to have some pre some pretty significant details for you but I think uh, yeah. we're a 50 plus were kind of um, actioned over the past year of, of the hundred that were mentioned. Charlotte how much royalty? So 50 plus are those actual construct? Like I'm just struggling between purchasing. So we're getting quite a bit of purchasing units and building units. So how many units were purchased versus built out of those 50 plus? Built by government? Yeah. Um, within that, uh, we are planning a small number of uh, of actual building ourselves. Uh, within the 50, most of them were purchased. Charlotte Town West Royalty? Small number. So which, which like, they're, well, they're built in you? I'm just, the details are all coming, so oh. I'm just reading off a sheet. So okay. Read yourself Minister, do you have any information on that? No, I don't. You don't have any? Charlotte Town West Royalty? So there was 100, there was 100 talked about being built, 50 plus actioned on, a small number built, and a lot purchased. Um, yeah, we're, uh, again, if you want to go, go down the list, and, it, it, and this is the, Trouble, but when you start going budget to budget to budget, you're, for some of these projects, they're multi-year projects, and we're trying not to count them twice. So we would have, um, you know, units planned in in, in Morrell, uh, ten units Morrell, ten units in Georgetown, ten Alberton. Um, we're um, thirty-one in uh, coming for for Summerside not being built, and thirty in, in Charlottetown out at the Beach Grove area, Beach Grove Road. Um, as well, we had uh, we're planning a, a build for three units at, uh, on Richmond Street. We acquired a, a parcel of property where that had 12 units on it for at Malbec Road, um, nine units on Kensington Road, uh, five units in Surrey, uh, six at St. Peter's Road, 10 units on Cumberland Street, four of the units that were talked about at Hunter River, um, a unit in, uh, in Stratford, and uh, four single-family homes being plan to be purchased. Charlottetown West Royalty? That makes up, that makes up our 50. That, that's, that makes up the 50, well, well it's 50 plus yeah. the first part of the... Sure. Charlottetown West Royalty? And I guess, I guess where I'm going is that it, we, we had so much trouble getting to 100 units last year. Now we, we got 300 and some units yeah. attached to that. That, that. that how much reasonably between now and next year, how many how many units of the 300 and or 465 are we gonna are we gonna do? Do we have a big project planned? Are we piecing this together to fix our housing crisis? Yeah, no, there, there's definitely some some big projects planned. Um, there's uh, some funding to uh, open up and develop some land at Hillsborough Park to put a some division in yeah. there. So we're they're planning for. Uh, 60 units out there with a plan to further so the, the actual infrastructure going in will be larger to accommodate more units um, 
Malpec Road, uh, the land that we acquired, acquired out there, they're planning uh, initially for 270 unit buildings to go on there. Um, and then uh, the one that the, the minister talked about is, is the, with the 150 units, that will be the mix of purchase, modular, and um, units that you can uh, kind of readily, wherever you can get a chunk of land, you can put a unit on. Charlotte, how much royalty? And the, you're not counting rental vouchers in that number, or any of those numbers? Correct. Okay. Um, so that, that uh, unit in Charlottetown is in Beach Grove. That that's we've talked about that several times. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, just <laughs> just the only thing that mm -hmm. the only thing it's uh, any action up there has been due to Fiona and not government on on that property. So um, so we've talked about it several times, but that's an important yeah. piece, and I, I've worked on talking to the community about how important that is. So it's a green light; it's ready to go. Like, what are we? The tender's been out. Break ground. When is the break ground? I guess, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever terms you well, want to Charlotte, use. Charlotte, what was your question? Sorry. It's when is that going to start? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, the, the, seriously. The, yeah, the information that you'll be coming in, which is the information that I have, um, they're, they're planning for completion in 24 25. So still at the planning stage. Charlotte, how much royalty? And I'm delighted to hear that. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that's an important. Uh, important building but that is would seem that that's the only 30 units in Charlottetown I don't see anything else in Charlottetown Mal, yeah, Malpec, Road. Malpec okay Malpec Hillsborough Road. Park Hillsborough Park okay. yeah and but for the the coming for the coming year that will be the only project that breaks ground in Charlottetown um, I think they're, they're planning to go um, Definitely on Richmond Street. There's three units under in the plan right now, so um, right, very, very close to here. Uh, mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty. Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll come back to some more questions there because I just got my sheet okay. and I, I'm not a very quick reader. So, um, a couple more questions. The the, the capital pair housing, um, three million six hundred and ten. What is the breakdown? For repairs to Hunt Court, and what what is what is planned for Hunt yeah. Court? I don't have the specifics as to where they're planning on it. Um, like uh, Health PEI, like Justice and Public Safety, um, you know the the staff in the department would be working with a list of priority repairs, um, and they will be working through the list um, a little bit faster now with a little more money available. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, how much royalty? Because even though the 2022-23 the, the, the budget was 1.153, I remember that number being $800,000 for as long as... What's that? 750. It was 750? 750,000. It was seven. So I was... Charlotte down West Royalty. So it was lower than I thought it was. Yeah. We'd round that off to 800,000. Okay, but, but then... Charlotte down West Royalty. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. How did the 22-23 get to be one point one? Five three. As as with any uh, budget that is established, we, we would pick a number based on what we think the the best the needs of, of the entity are, and as the year goes on, sometimes the needs are greater. Um, so that they'd be kind of doing the repairs that were required. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown West Royalty, maybe another question or okay. two. Sure, yeah. We'll be back yeah. on the list. So the the Fiona damage that happened. Like if we're looking at 501, it's still like it's it's there. That's going to be repaired. All that's going to be covered by insurance. So all those outside, all the roofing things for those senior units, are going to be covered by insurance. What is the priority for that 3.6 million dollars? If that stuff is being covered by insurance, what what are our priorities for these units for repairs? Um, again, this is kind of a future-oriented budget, so this will start in April. I suspect they'll be gathering the uh, the needs uh, of the corporation and, and making a plan to get uh, the work done as on a priority basis. I don't know what, who's at the top of the list and which units are in the, the greatest need. One more question there, Cheryl. How much, Cheryl? Can I put you back in the list? Yeah, and, um, and, and resources within this, just it seems it seems an impossible... Um, 
possible to, unless we outsource the work. I mean, there's not enough employees there. Are, are, it's, it's kind of operational, but I have to I have to ask this about this. Are we planning on expanding um, the number of employees? Or are we planning on outsource to get this work done? Um, the fastest way normally is, is through contractors. Um, I know that's been challenging over the last uh, year or two um, as the economy has been particularly um, hot. Um, so I think the department's looking at that very question right now, the mix of uh, your own people versus um, con outside contractors. Mm, thank you, Gordon. Appreciate it, Chair. Thank you, Rush Royalty. Uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you tell me which public housing facilities will be getting repairs in the next year? I ha there's, it, there's the, I know we got our notes here, but it just, it, do you have any more specifics on that? Um, no, I no, I, I don't have the specifics as, as I'd indicated to, uh, to to the other member there. Um, this is a future-oriented budget, so starting in April of next year, um, the the department and the corporation would be kind of doing some needs assessments at all their properties all the time. They would have a, a constant list of things that need to get done, and as things get done, new items get kind of placed on the bottom, and, and we just kind of keep kind of evergreening the properties. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And um, something that I've been asking for for the last few years is to see this infamous capital prioritization list. Does, does such a list exist, I guess, would be my starting point. Um, I have not seen it. I all I could do is ask to see if, the, if it's available. Yeah. yeah uh, no, Charlottetown, we, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. We've had no luck getting that as well. I, I you know. Not exactly what you said. And, you know, when I see this, department creates and prioritizes a listing based on current need as predetermined by building inspections, reports from tenants and age. We don't even keep a record of people who call in for public seniors housing. So how in heck are we going to keep a list, per Minister, of these uh, issues? How, how do you get issues from tenants if you don't record them, Minister? Well, yeah, I think he identified that that was definitely a need um, in, in question period. So again, and I think from a capital improvement perspective, I think I think it changes over time, obviously, and events like Fiona obviously push things up the list and push other things down the list. So I think any list would be a snapshot in time, uh, obviously, and it would it would change over time. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to say how shameful it is how we have completely neglected our publicly owned seniors units. We do not keep track of, of issues when they're called in. So this, to me, is a complete sham that we would even write this on this piece of paper that we take reports from tenants. Um, so it's listing is reviewed again in spring of each year before tenders go out based on how buildings over winter so we have needed new roofs in in some of our buildings for close to 20 years so do these do, i guess there is no list so these questions are kind of pointless but i want i'd like to make a point do we just keep adding these same places to lists or do we just ignore them continually every year how do we how do we do that what's that process minister I, I guess I would point to the fact that we tripled the budget and that we, we are addressing the problem. It's right? about time. Yeah. Minister of the floor. Yeah, so I, so I would agree. Again, we are addressing it. When, you know, again, we are tripling the budget, which is not this is significant. So um, that's a good thing. Charlotte, I'm Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. My last point before I move on to my questions, it's about darn time. We had an aggressive budget on housing after the neglect. Had. And I don't think that saying we have an aggressive budget is anything truly to tout right now, considering how neglectful it was the last couple of years. So certainly an, uh, an aggressive budget, perhaps, compared to what it has been, but certainly nowhere near it should have ever been. So that is the point I would like to make. Um, how much of, and you may, I think, Gord, that you kind of went into this. So if, if, if this question has already been answered, just let me know. I'm wondering if we have uh, kept track of the housing stock damage, the, the publicly owned um, st housing stock that was damaged by Fiona. Do we have a, 
do we have a, a clear picture of that? Um, yeah, we, we have a risk management uh, section within the Department of Finance that works with, uh, you know, health, education, and, and social development housing and, and any of the uh, departments that are running facilities um, across the province. And they've been working with, with, with everyone to try to assess, gather, uh, document, and uh, start the process for repair for sure. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so do you have a, a, a breakdown of how much this capital repair budget is related to Fiona? Um, our, it's, it's our hope that um, any of the damage that was caused by Fiona would be covered through insurance. So I, I wouldn't say that there would be a large portion because um, these were more uh, immediate repairs that we required right now that would be more in, in the forecast. And, and I'm not aware that there's a, a lot of money in the forecast related to repairs related to Fiona. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So we don't really... Forgive my, me if I'm misunderstanding this, but we don't really have kind of a breakdown in this budget. What's Fiona, what's not? That Fiona's not really been captured in this budget, is that? Um, the, the things that we were thinking about for Fiona were more future-oriented because this budget is for 23-24, so it's the period starting next year. So any of the damage that would be related to Fiona really couldn't wait till that point in time. We'd have to go out and get the repairs done and it's my understanding the majority of the repairs uh, would hopefully be covered under insurance. Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you Chair. Um, I'm wondering, so of course as has been mentioned in here several times, seniors have been reporting significant <laughs> maintenance issues with their public housing units and the 2022-2023 the forecast is almost identical to the budget. So I'm wondering, um, are seniors going to have to wait until the next fiscal year to get their issues addressed, or what, how are we going to fix those issues in this? Um, there's there's a couple of couple of spots that uh, the department has access. Um, the stuff that's in the capital budget would or would be more large items that would um, enhance the, the the length of the the life of the building. So the, the smaller repairs, if you were talking about a, a handbar or a light switch or things like that, would be more of an operational nature. So they, they would have an operational budget as well as a capital budget to improve and enhance the, the buildings. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so I suppose the, you know, the, the, there are several um, publicly owned seniors homes that have been identified as needing new roofs. So will we see that be prioritized? Um, yeah, roofs. Um, the envelope of the building is always a big consideration for any time you have a capital repair um, set, of, set of needs. Uh, the, the, best, the best is to keep, keep the envelope uh, tight. Um, so if, if it was, again, Fiona related, they're, they're got to be working on them, um, you know, before the, the snow flies and, and be more of an insurance uh, job. But uh, uh, we do have a lot of lot of roofs um, on a lot of buildings in PEI, and I know that's one of the areas that, uh, that the staff are, are constantly reviewing to see uh, what's needed and, and when. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, um, our Chair, our, can we go on to construction housing, or do is can we do anything under capital improvements right now, or do I have to wait until... Well, I think, actually, we're going to be coming to the end of government time right. for the day, oh, okay. so... We will stop there. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, all your questions. Thanks for coming. Must be, it's got my name on this page. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry?
Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having under consideration the grant of capital supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Short carry. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, I move seconded by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke that the 36th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? carry? Order 36, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number 4, Bill number 128, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall it carry? Bill number 128, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number 4, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Time Valley Sherbrooke that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shaw Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. is now in a committee of the whole house taking into consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the employment standards act number four a request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor shall it be granted Please state your name and position for Hansard. Uh, I'm Nathan Hood, Senior Policy Advisor to the Official Opposition. Thank you, Nathan, and welcome. Um, promoter, would you like to begin by giving just a brief statement on the bill's intent? Yes, I would, Chair. Thank you. And if you'll uh, just indulge me for a minute, I'd like to just recognize Marie Burge, who's uh, joined us in the gallery uh, from the Cooper Institute and the PEI Working Group for Livable Income. Thank you for joining us, Marie. The COVID-19 pandemic has drawn attention to the need for improved access to sick leave for workers. Throughout the pandemic, health experts, labor organizations, and economists have stressed the importance of paid sick leave in preventing the spread of illness like COVID-19. Lack of sick leave can lead to prolonged illness, reduced productivity and economic disruption, and further spread of illness. Inadequate paid sick leave disproportionately impacts the most economically and medically vulnerable. Low income workers are the least likely to have paid sick leave while also being the least likely to be able to work from home. In British Columbia, for example, the seniors advocate found that long term care and assisted living sites that offered less paid sick leave were more likely to experience COVID-19 outbreaks than other sites. We hear from government frequently. If you're home, or sorry, if you're sick, stay home. We hear from Dr. Morrison and CPHO, stay home when you are sick. However, we have to ask ourselves, how are we empowering Islanders to do this? It is neither fair nor realistic to expect island workers to follow this guidance if they are not financially and legally supported to make this decision. We have a special leave fund, but this is not a long-term solution. First, this program depends on employers applying to the, to the fund. In some instances, island employers are not applying on behalf of their workers, leaving those workers without financial support. 
Second, we've seen no long-term commitment to the continued operation of the fund. The fund has been extended after I inquired about it, but island workers should not have to worry that their access to paid sick leave could disappear at any given time. I'm proud to sponsor this legislation that would provide workers regulated under the Employment Standards Act with up to 10 days of paid sick leave per year. This is something that I and my office have been working on for months, and we believe now is the right time to make this change. We can't wait for the Employment Standards Act review, which will not only take another year to finish, but will require additional months, if not years, of work to draft new legislation and consult again with stakeholders. By legislating paid sick days, we create permanence and security for workers. It allows sick leave benefits to be paid out directly by the employer, which is the quickest and least administratively cumbersome approach to get support in the hands of workers. Workers deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and to know that they matter, that their health and well-being matters. This legislation is an essential step to ensure all workers can take the time they need to get well when they are sick and prevent spread of illness to others. This is a basic right that we should all have. I look forward to debate on this legislation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read section by section or just open up the general questions as a whole? I'll choose the latter since there's been no response. So we are now taking questions. Or actually, I'm taking questions. Anybody on the list? No question. The Minister of Economic Growth and Tourism. Chair, and thank you, members, and uh, welcome to the floor. And uh, this is uh, an, an interesting bill, which, you know, I uh, paid sick leave is definitely a topic of conversation now. And with the changing climate of our workforce, it's, uh, it's important to talk about this and debate this. Uh, I know you've been uh, copied on a lot of responses that I've been getting and, uh, and from several of the stakeholders. Uh, Federation of Labor raised some concerns when I had a meeting with them and uh, can you tell us who you consulted with and uh, what you heard? Yes, uh, certainly, Minister, I can. Um, so we had uh, two rounds of uh, consultation on this legislation. Uh, started um, in the spring, uh, we had a draft of this legislation that we put out uh, for public consultation, as well as sending out to a list of stakeholders. And we do have the stakeholder list here of, of who we sent to and who we had feedback from at that time. Um, it is a long list, and the writing is very small. But uh, would you like me to go over the entire list? Well, if you can make copies, but I, I'll... Have you heard is Somerset Chamber of Commerce? Um, yeah, we definitely heard concerns uh, and questions from some of the uh, the chambers on the island, including the Somerset Chamber of Commerce. Um, just to uh, to... I guess I got distracted by the tiny writing on the page here. But um, to just elaborate on the consultation process that has uh, we've undergone. So we went through uh, public consultation on the first draft. We took feedback from stakeholders across all sectors, so from chambers, from labor groups, from uh, individuals, from not-for-profit organizations, from advocacy groups, as well as uh, feedback that we received from your department. And at that time, we certainly appreciated the uh, open consultation and uh, we worked very hard to respond to the feedback uh, that was provided from your department and uh, and make some changes to the bill um, now that being said of course we will not make everybody happy but we work toward the end goal of ensuring that workers are protected to have access to paid sick leave so that they are able to take the time that they need when they are sick to get well that is the goal so we made some changes, put out a second draft for consultation, also again solicited feedback from as many, any, we sent it to every stakeholder group we could think of, um, as well as public consultation, as well as sending to your department. Um, so this has been a very long, long process uh, for us and one that we have, have uh, certainly engaged with uh, genuinely at every step of the way. 
Um, if you have uh, any other specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer sure. there. Just wanted to give you the context. Uh, intervention from the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thanks, you, thank you, Chair. I'm just curious, and I don't want to recess or anything, I'm just wondering if we could get a copy to, to look at of the, the list of stakeholders just while we're reviewing the legislation. Is that a possibility? Of the list of stakeholders that we reach yeah. out to? Yeah. Well, like I say, sure. I don't want to recess or anything. Um, I'm just I'm wondering if that's yeah. larger print. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, we will probably. work that out we can and start have that distributed as soon, soon as it's available. Start that pro I can't yeah. do that right here, okay. but um, certainly, yeah. yeah. Sure. I can. I mean, you'll see once you see the list that uh, there was a, a. We sent it to everybody we could possibly think of, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to share that. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. Okay, Minister of so Economic so Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, with all that consultation and all the work you've done. Mm -hmm. so are you know we usually publish a report the consultation do you guys have a report to publish that was published or Our, uh, I don't know that that's a, maybe a summary of conversations or anything for the public that's record a process that you normally do I will say that um, you know groups have been uh, open and able to share with the public the any consultation that they provided with us and I know that some groups have done that um, but, you know, if you have specific, you know, questions about feedback we heard, certainly I'm happy to answer those. But I do want to stress again that, um, you know, we have worked very hard to try to address as many of the concerns as we can um, while holding to the core value that we need to make sure workers have access to those paid sick days. I will highlight, uh, you know, one thing, for example, that we changed um, based on feedback that we received in the second draft. Um, uh, from the first draft is we included um, uh, clear uh, recognition in right in the bill with the strongest language that I could possibly include um, from my position as a as a non-government member um, that uh, the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture may implement a financial support program to provide temporary financial support to be given to employers to help them adapt to any increased cost associated with the paid sick leave. And I would say that that is certainly something that we do support and have actually supported from the start. Um, particularly for our small local businesses, there will be some who require some support in this adjustment. Uh, and since we know that government has had the paid, uh, sorry, the special leave fund uh, throughout COVID, our suggestion would be a transition of this fund uh, to target those small local businesses to ensure that they are uh, supported in the transition uh, to paid sick days. The Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. So you have nothing to table? That was, that was my question. Do you have anything from your consultations to table for the public record? I'm just, I'm, I'm okay. all about transparency here. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we get questions all the time, so it's yeah. kind of, you know. It's interesting. So there's nothing I mean, for the public record. Uh, it's interesting. I don't believe we've ever had, that I can recall, a report produced for pieces. I mean, you've, government has produced several pieces of well, legislation just this sitting and... Yeah. I'm sorry, the so, has the floor. So I don't really understand this request, but if you have questions, I mean, as you noted, uh, many stakeholders have reached out to you directly as well. Um, so uh, there isn't a report to table, which is something that I'm hearing for the first time as a thing that we've never ever done with any other piece of legislation, nor have you. So I don't really know what to say to that. The Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Okay, I'll, I'll move off that. Uh, so. What kind of impact analysis have you done on, on this? That's a great question, actually. I will say that that was something that uh, when we originally were consulting with your department under the previous minister, there was some discussion at that time of working with the department, who obviously has uh, certainly more resources and ability to uh, conduct that type of analysis. And we uh, were really looking forward to, uh, to hearing more about that work in the department. Um, so I, I suppose, do you have anything to report back on that? Because we would have certainly loved that information. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Well, this is in my bill. This is uh, that I'm bringing here today. But, uh, you know, from what we've seen, the reports that we look at, 40, 
eight to fifty eight percent of workers don't have access to paid sick leave. So that's the, okay. the numbers we see. Yeah. Have you seen those numbers? Uh, that is not a number that I have seen specifically on for PEI. I don't believe. Do yeah. we have those that, those numbers? Yeah, we do. Would, no, well, that, that would sound be under right. And I mean, it's okay. part of the, the challenge is I know there's some figures in that mm -hmm. ballpark that are from a few years ago. Um, we've also looked at statistics, Canada data, because of course this legislation is focusing on uh, primarily non-unionized workers under the uh, Employment Standards Act. And Statistics Canada says that about, um, I think it's 33.4% of island workers are covered by a collective agreement. So for the workers who aren't, some of them might have some uh, access to paid sick leave uh, because of course there are private sector employers, like think of ones that are more professionalized or for higher paying uh, employment. Uh, they would already have access to paid sick leave. But for a lot of those workers, they wouldn't have um, paid sick leave. So you're probably right. It would be somewhere in, in that ballpark for sure. So economic, uh, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Yeah, and you're, luck you're right. There is a lot of workers that do have paid sick leave. How many of those would have 10 days paid sick leave of your research? Uh, we wouldn't be able to determine that based on uh, our research. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Um, I think we all can agree that this would be a significant cost to business. Business stakeholders who've reached out to me and have raised concerns about the cost of this program, particularly given that they're facing the same inflation pressures and costs that everyone is. Um, what is the cost of your proposal for the island employers? I, um, I think we can all agree, Minister, that this is already a significant cost to workers who are the ones that are paying this currently. They are the ones that are missing out on pay or going to work sick. So, you know, when we're talking about the cost, I think we need to look at both sides of this and we need to really focus on the fact that the workers who, many of them, as we stated, cannot afford to lose a day's pay that it is our low-income workers that are most likely to not have access to paid sick days that are directly impacted, that they are the ones who are currently paying the cost of this. Um, when we look at uh, what the cost will be to overall, it's, it's very difficult to calculate, and we've tried many ways, and there are many variables that will uh, come into play that decrease that overall cost. You've mentioned some of them today, but I'm going to hand it over to Nate, who's been doing some of this analysis to give a, a little bit of an overview on and what some of those might be. Just before you begin, Nathan, um, I know the configuration in here sometimes is difficult, and we have a tendency when we speak to people to turn around yep. and speak to them directly oh, face to face. But I've been preaching this for a few years now, and I know it's yesterday really when hard. I was in your position, <laughs> I did the exact same thing. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, we're just having a little difficulty picking up sure. uh, uh, the audio. Sure. So if you could just keep that in, in mind, yeah. we would appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, it's, um, it is challenging to cost for, for a number of reasons. And um, as we kind of alluded to, some of the, <laughs> make sure I stay focused on the mic, some of it is um, the data availability, right? So um, I know when we were costing it, um, we looked at, you know, we used summer employment numbers, but some of the challenges with those numbers is, for example, we can't extract uh, workers who would be self-employed from those numbers. We can't necessarily extract workers who um, might not be covered by the Employment Standards Act and therefore this legislation wouldn't affect. Um, it's difficult because those numbers would also include unionized workers to some degree. So you can try to pull them out, but it might not be entirely reflective um, or like as accurate as you would like it to be um, due to the data limitations. There's also the fact, I think, uh, the member was probably alluding to a little bit. Um, you know, people are, are paying the cost, right, when they have to um, go to work sick. And there are also costs for business, because that, mm -hmm. that policy does cost businesses. And I mean, I have literature here, uh, like the Ontario Science Table has spoken about that, that when uh, workers have to go to work sick, it leads to more outbreaks in workplaces. It leads to reduced productivity because workers are going in and they're not performing to their best. So these are costs that businesses are actually carrying now. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, there's nothing to, to help those businesses really avoid those costs, right? Because we, we aren't really um, providing workers with paid sick leave benefits to make sure that they're uh, able to stay home and prevent you know, further illness in their workplace. Um, 
Yeah, is there anything else you mm -hmm. want to do? And on? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Nate. That was uh, very helpful. And I think I would just reiterate again that as well, we would expect there would be some support coming from government for those small businesses. So the costs would be shared, in my mind, between government and business. But there are businesses that can afford this and that should be, should be providing their workers with paid sick days. If you legislate it first, you ensure all workers have access, then you can target supports to those businesses who really need it. And that's where government steps in to provide those supports. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. So uh, to this, Nathan, yep. um, you said you had numbers. Okay. The question I asked was about proposals. And you said you had numbers. What are the numbers? OK. I can give you a number, but yeah. do you want me to read the like page or so? No, just give me the. Uh, no, we no will explain no. it because okay. you cannot give a number without explanation because you won't know so. what the number means. So he's going to okay. go ahead and so, explain that. So the high number and the way we designed this was we made it to be well, we made it to be a conservative estimate because we wanted to make sure that we weren't understating the potential cost of this. But by doing that, it means that the number is inflated uh, over what it would cost, and I'll explain. I'll give you examples of how it's overinflated and how the costs come down. So the first number we arrived at, and this is not adjusted, was 11.1 um, million for one day of paid sick leave. But what I'll note is that we used labor force data for July 2022, which was around the time we had basically record employment for the province, which also, because we're a seasonal economy, does not reflect how big our labor force is at any given point in the year. So, for example, we would have many, we have fewer workers in the winter, as an example. So, that that number would go down significantly in in the winter or in the off season. Um, we used average hourly rates to determine um, pay information, which of course can be distorted by higher incomes. Uh, I'll note too that uh, unionized workers tend to earn higher incomes, and of course those uh, those workers are exempt from this legislation. So again, that could be overstating um, income data we use to calculate this number. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this data includes self-employed workers. We can't carve them out from the data sets. So there are costs associated with those workers that we can't uh, reasonably extract from, from that estimate. Um, basically, uh, the, the collective agreement uh, coverage rates is not available by um, industry on Prince Edward Island. So we know that 33.4% uh, are covered by a collective agreement, so 66.6% .6 would not be. Um, but the challenge is we can't break that down by industry. And why that's important is, like I mentioned earlier, unionized workers tend to earn more money. So you think of sectors like healthcare, um, you think of sectors like education, um, uh, social services, like government. Uh, these are all sectors that would report kind of more on the higher range of incomes of, of industries on PEI. But again, we can't calculate exactly um, how many of those workers are unionized in, in each of those sectors. So as a result, we ended up assuming that 30 or 66.6% or .6 were non-unionized. So of course, that overstates how many, um, how many healthcare workers, how many education workers, and such would be included. So for example, if we use Canada's uh, industry-specific unionization rates to adjust it, it would mean a reduction of about 2.1 to 2.2 million dollars from that. Um, another thing as well, I think farm workers are, are exempt under the Act for pay, so um, that's another couple hundred thousand that would be pulled from that number. So, and I mean, this also doesn't account for the fact that if people are using paid sick leave, um, it means that we're going to have less illness in the workplace, which again reduces mm -hmm. the cost for employers because there's less of a need for the sick days if fewer people are sick as a result of having access to that benefit. Um, we should note that it's typically younger workers who do not have access to paid sick leave, but younger workers are also less likely than older workers to require paid sick leave in the first place, um, which again would depress demand for it. Um, I mean, I have more. I think that kind of gives you a general idea. Uh, my guess would be probably somewhere in the mid to high seven figure range for a day. But again, it's dependent on a lot of variables and some of them we can't really control for um, 
So we just tried to do our best to give a, a conservative estimate of what it would cost. But again, I think maybe I'm going to read your mind, but I think as the sponsor I mentioned earlier, this is also, I think, it has to be looked at as these are wages that workers are losing, right? This is missed income. And so these are workers who now are going to be struggling to pay for food. They're going to be struggling to pay for their rent. They're going to be struggling to feed their children. And we, we, there's no safety net. We have a temporary safety net. And the idea here is to make sure that we're continuing um, to support them in, in earning their income so that they're not put in a tough situation where they have to choose between staying home when they're sick or you know, putting others at risk to, to earn a living. Mm -hmm. There was one more variable I'll add to that extensive list. Uh, every day that you are calculating there, the cost would decrease because uh, not everybody takes all of the paid sick days that they have available. That's so that's another factor to consider. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. So, Nathaniel, can you <coughs> table that analysis? Like, I heard $11 million a day. That's what you started. To I say. love that's all you that that's all you heard. I can't believe that's I don't all remember. you heard. Sorry. Just one moment. Okay. Okay. Can you can you table your analysis? Yeah, I'm sure I could provide you with a coffee afterwards. Hey, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. So in BC they recently brought five days mm -hmm. paid sick uh, after ninety days of employment. Mm -hmm. Why did you settle on ten knowing the concerns of small businesses? Yeah, so uh, there's quite a few reasons for that. So there's considerable evidence from across the country that uh, economists, health experts who are all calling for a minimum of 10 days. We know that OECD countries, uh, the average is actually 20 days. So, you know, while this would be um, 10 days would be the first province in Canada to go to 10, it's certainly not unprecedented. And there is qu uh, quite a lot of uh, evidence to show the value of uh, providing at least 10 days for workers. As well, when you look at the average number of days that workers actually need and are already using here on Prince Edward Island, we're looking at around uh, 10 days already. So this is really just to reflect the need that, that exists already. Um, there's also certainly a gendered aspect to this. So we also know that women are more likely to need more paid sick days um, due to illness or um, other reasons. So uh, when we are looking at uh, making sure we are offering enough paid sick days, providing that for workers, we have to consider that uh, women are disproportionately impacted uh, by not having appropriate access to those paid days. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Um, I've had a couple meetings with the Federation of Labor, and uh, they raise concerns about the exclusion of unionized workplaces under this bill. Mm -hmm. um, I know the department provided you with some feedback on that earlier, and earlier draft, and you needed to consider how your bill interacts with the collective agreements. Mm -hmm. Do you did you do that review, and uh, what did you find, and decide to? Why did you continue to exclude unionized workers? So this was a, certainly a very difficult one for me. I did not want to exclude unions. It was part of the first draft. But as you note, that was feedback we received from the department uh, that there is a conflict that occurs then between the Employment Standards Act and the Labor Act and how uh, paid sick days would be um, dealt with should there be any issues. As well, many collective agreements already include language around paid sick days that uh, may not align with what we have in our legislation. So trying to deal with that, with this sort of issue that exists between the Employment Standards Act and the Labor Act is not uh, something that we were able to resolve in this legislation. However, I have since spoken with Carl Percy and with the Federation of Labor and made a commitment that we are working together, and he's already started this process, to go through every single collective agreement on the island to assess you know, what paid sick leave exists in those collective agreements, where the conflicts would arise between this legislation, should it pass, and what's in those collective agreements, so that we can ensure that workers covered by a collective agreement who don't have at least this minimum level of provision for paid sick leave will be included, and I, I would I certainly plan to bring further amendments to include those workers in the future. However, that work is, on, is ongoing and will take time, and there are tens of thousands of workers, or however many, you know, you, you gave a percentage, a range of 48 to 58 percent of workers, I believe you, you had said, on the island that don't have access to paid sick leave. 
the majority of those are non-unionized workers, and uh, we want to put forward this legislation now to ensure as many workers as possible are covered, have access to paid sick days as soon as possible, particularly with the reality that the isolation requirements are being lifted and protections for workers to access, uh, ensure they have access to paid sick leave are being removed. So we need to make sure we have a long-term plan here, and uh, this is a first and important step to, uh, toward that. Minister of Economic Growth uh, and Tourism. Uh, thank you. And, uh, it's a little disappointing that, you know, the comprehensive review would probably work that into it, but I, I understand your your urgency to get this through. Um, section three five, the rate of pay. Is there? Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand this formula. When you, I'm just not sure if there's an error in that or calculating paid sick leave, but. Uh, the employer shall pay the employee for the day of an amount determined by the formula A times B, where A is the number of days in the period of leave. If you are calculating one day of its benefits, would it would you need to be valued as one day, or should you have have one day valued as multiple days? Uh, according to this formula, if the employee is taking was taking three days of sick leave, I would have to calculate that three times the value of the time missed. Do you need to correct that? I'm just clarifying. I'm gonna I'm gonna have pass that over to Nate to answer, but I just want to respond to a comment that you started your question with. Um, I think it's quite unfortunate that the employment standards review uh, wasn't started at the beginning of the mandate of this government because it would be done by now and we wouldn't be in this situation. But we we have probably a year or more beyond that for legislation to come forward. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Nate, are you able to? Uh, yeah, so that? as far as the, the calculation um, of how it's paid, so yeah, so we distinguish because obviously the circumstances uh, of employment could be different for different employees. So for example, for a salaried employee, it's probably pretty straightforward. You know what you'd be getting paid for a day of work. So we felt that was a simple formula. Um, I think, yes, if I understand what you're saying, um, it's basically to cover the wages that would have been lost um, due to the to the absence of the worker from illness. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. So that formula is correct. Correct. Yeah. And where did you? It's this is a formula you've seen somewhere else, or? I think we had had some discussion. Yeah, and, this, yeah it was know. based on uh, feedback that we received. So um, you know, basically to. Uh, ah. One of the concerns that we heard from uh, from some stakeholders was in, uh, you know, how we would calculate a day's pay or uh, a day's leave and how that pay would work. So, for example, if someone is scheduled uh, for four hours that day, do they get paid for the full eight hours if they get a sick day? No, they don't. They get paid for the number of hours that they were scheduled for. So that uh, we felt was the most fair way uh, to address those concerns and the most the clearest a clear way to do that um, to ensure that workers would be compensated for the amount uh, for which they were scheduled to work. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but if not, you can certainly ask uh, for more clarification. I just want... Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. I just want, for the record, that this formula is correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, section 35B, when you say rate of pay, is that the correct term or should it be rate of wages? I think it's rate of pay is the, the correct term. Yeah, I know there's a discrepancy. Um, if there is an amendment you want to bring forward, we could look at that. I know there are different definitions um, for those terms. And I don't think that was a conscious uh, difference. It might have been importing um, language from another bill um, that might have led to that discrepancy. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Well, Section 3.5, you haven't included a mechanism for calculating leave for workers paid by piecework. Uh, for example, some massage therapists, or estheticians, and hairdressers are paid by piecework. How is sick leave calculated for these workers? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if this uh, uh, probably, as far as I can tell, that wouldn't necessarily be covered under this legislation. They would be reimbursed for their hourly, is how I would understand that. But I know that um, 
commission workers wouldn't be covered under this, so it would probably be very similar to that, I would think. But we'll have Nate, Nate will have a little look here and we'll see if we can. It comes down to, I think, um, the definitions that are already in the Employment Standards Act, so that's what we're going back to now to see where. Um, yeah, uh, two sub two would be um, the provision, only the provisions of this act relating to the payment and protection of pay apply to the following employees, sale persons whose income is derived primarily from commissions on sales and farm laborers. So it's possible that they might not be covered under that uh, language. So they're not covered? Minister of Economic Growth tourism and culture it's possible but again this was not a because we had met with the department and I know the first time and I'll give credit to the, the former minister we did get a good um, series of, of suggestions right where the department um, had flagged issues and we made changes to reflect those um, I don't believe this was a to my knowledge a, a section where we had received feedback from the department of an issue Minister of Economic Growth tourism and culture so Section 36A gives one paid day after day 30 of employment, and then another day is earned on day 31, correct? And at the beginning of each month, so three days entitlement would accumulate fairly rapidly. Is this the case? Yeah. It depends on your definition of fairly rapidly. In the first um, draft of our legislation, we uh, had after one month, you an employee would earn three days right away. Um, so this is actually less rapid than the original draft. We worked very hard. This was something that actually, this language we did um, go back and forth quite a bit uh, to try to make it as clear as possible um, and as simple as possible for employers to be able to administer. So the first 30 days is really seen as a probation period uh, and then calculating beyond that um, is why you see that accumulation of the extra day to simplify the further calculation beyond that uh, that it would be um, at the beginning of each month of employment um, moving forward so that's sort of how we if the, you know I don't know if Nate have anything else you want to add to yeah, that but it I was guess, something that we worked on to very hard yeah I guess what I'll add is yeah it is a section we had tweaked because I think mm -hmm. the language we had used and I believe it was pulled from the federal legislation mm -hmm. it was a little bit uh, as one person described it to me as a dog's breakfast it was just yeah. <laughs> kind of difficult to read so we we redrafted it in a way that we felt was a lot clearer um, as far as how it would operate um, if it became law and as uh, the sponsor had mentioned um, it was originally uh, 30 days after um, one month of work um, but that was changed after uh, three consultation days. Or, yeah three days after consultation with uh, business stakeholders yeah. Minister of Economic Growth Tourism and Culture so it seems a little clunky when you put dates in there like why not just say day X after 30 days of employment would that I would just say minister if you have an amendment that uh, holds to the integrity of the bill but you feel would be more clear we'd certainly be willing to entertain that um, this was the language that we felt was uh, after consultation and uh, um, as Nate mentioned the uh, modeling after the federal legislation we got a lot of feedback that it was very confusing um, this we felt this was the most clear uh, but if you have other suggestions, um, again, that, those suggestions were not provided to us uh, when we gave you this, the draft of the bill, um, but we are certainly open to, the, to hearing, you know, if you have a, a different way to, you would think that should be worded. Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, I'm going to ask if, uh, if this will be the last question now, I'm going to jump to someone else and I can come back to you, if you so choose. Yeah, you, I'll, you can come back to me. Okay. Did you want to have another question now, or do you want me to come back? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this has been a really interesting discussion thus far, and I want to thank you for bringing this bill forward, Time Valley, Sherbrooke, and thank you, Nate, for being on the floor, <laughs> as always. Um, I want to start by asking a pretty general question, and I'm wondering what you've heard. We haven't 
we've spoken a lot about the potential economic impacts of this, but um, I'm wondering what you heard when you spoke with workers regarding this mm -hmm. bill. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, we have been hearing from workers uh, who are um, just desperate and, and uh, afraid of, of what, what they will do if they become sick and are um, right now knowing that in particular that the uh, isolation requirements are lifting, not knowing if the special leave fund will be in place in the long term, which you know we have no commitment for that. There is, uh, you know, genuine concerns, fear that people will not be able to make ends meet if they become ill. And unfortunately, as we know, the reality is, COVID is is has changed, but it is still with us. Uh, you know, we have people who are becoming ill with COVID every day, and the anything that we can do. And again, this is from you know public health as well as stresses that we can do to reduce the spread of illness uh, is uh, is something that I think we should be standing behind. And this that's why we bring this legislation. But certainly, workers, um, they you know I'm hearing from workers who are paycheck to paycheck. They can't afford to miss a day, and. Uh, you know, they're having to choose between, you know, going to work sick or, you know, staying home and not being able to, to pay their bills. And no one should ever have to make that choice. Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. I appreciate that answer. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, we can have many, and we've already had a bit of discussion about the relative merits of this piece of legislation. And that, I suspect, will go on for some time. And that's what this debate should be all about. But um, I found it uh, rather odd that the first questions that were asked were about were questioning the validity or the extens extensiveness of the work that you've done in preparation to be here on the floor. And um, I personally know that you spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in consultation. This is the second draft of this piece of legislation. You had a very close working relationship with the previous minister in this file. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of back and forth on that. And I'm wondering, with the current minister, whom I believe you had reached out to a number of times, whether there have been any requests in those times that you have reached out to the current minister for any of the information or concerns that we're hearing here today. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, certainly, the uh, we when we started work on this bill, I was uh, very, um, you know, impressed and 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 uh, and happy to be working with the minister at that time because uh, there really was genuine engagement and we received a, a significant amount of feedback from the department. Uh, some there were at some times at that time some issues with the bill that they brought to our attention that we agreed needed to be changed and we were happy to do that work um, and. Uh, looked forward to further discussion. Uh, I've not received any feedback uh, prior to what you've heard on the floor here from the minister um, on this particular piece, this second draft, um, or from the new minister at all. So no, I, don't, I have not, we have not had that engagement. Um, however, should uh, the minister, you know, wish to have any further engagement, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, to do that. But otherwise, I suppose we will be continuing the discussion here on the floor as we have been. Leader of the Opposition. And actually, you know, I think it's important that we do have this debate and discussion on the floor in the full light of day, and Islanders can listen along and read what questions were asked and what responses were taken afterwards. So I actually have no problem with that at all. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was asked by the Minister was whether we have a report on the consultation that, mm -hmm. that you had done. And I've sat in this House for, you know, very long, to, well, a number of years, and I've actually never seen a report on consultation that's been done. Certainly government has had bills where there's been extensive consultation done. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the Water Act, I'm thinking of the Land Protection Act. I, I, I can certainly give examples where government has done extensive consultation with the public, sometimes lasting many years, um, but never, don't ever remember seeing a report from that. You know, the, the, the outcome of that would generally be evident in amendments to a draft piece of legislation or incorporation of new ideas or something like that. And I can point to at least a couple of pieces of legislation from government in this sitting where not only did we not have a report on consultation done, but it wasn't clear where, whether any consultation at all was done on that. So um, I, 
Again, I think it's absolutely worthy and important that we talk about the relative merits of this bill and the potential costs and the potential benefits, um, both financial and social and, and uh, personal and health-wise. Um, but I, I do want to defend the work that my colleague has done in consultation on this bill. And even though we may not have a report, although I, I understand the papers that you brought in today will be copied and distributed, I think there's no doubt that the level of consultation on this piece of legislation is absolutely not lacking. Uh, I'm fine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I uh, just say one thing in, sure. in response yep. to that? I, and uh, thank you uh, very much for for those comments. I, I want. I just want to bring something to uh, to everyone's attention too. Uh, when we're talking about consultation on a bill like this, a bill that is, uh, you know, going to have a direct impact on the lives of some of our, you know, most vulnerable workers, those who are most precarious. Um, they don't have. Uh, they're not, those workers who are not unionized don't have um, an organized voice to speak for them. They don't have any groups that are advocating for them. So, you know, those are workers who are working, as I said, paycheck to paycheck, trying to get by. Uh, they don't have any, any strong voice, any, any, any organization that is speaking on their behalf. And um, I think we have to keep that in mind in our consultation as well, that the, you know, those workers deserve uh, to be considered, even though they don't have that organization, like perhaps businesses have with the chambers. Okay. Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honourable <coughs> Member, uh, for uh, bringing this to the floor. I, uh, I know you've put a, a lot of work into this over the, the last year. I do recognize that, and I know we've sat around the table many times and uh, have, have tried to work through some of this. Um, where I always had the issue that and it was something we could never figure out, and I know I worked with a lot of my colleagues from across the country, is to figure out how many businesses pay sick days now, mm -hmm. how many don't, and to figure out the cost. And, and I know with dealing with the federal minister and other provinces, everybody recognizes that we need uh, legislation like this, mm -hmm. um, but nobody can find the perfect formula to, to figure out what the cost would be. And, and that was always my question on it, is any piece of legislation we bring, we might want to make sure, yes, it fixes a problem, but we want to make sure it doesn't create a, another problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, and maybe numbers ha have changed, but like the numbers that were always giving, given to me and through the department, and this was strictly by guess, because there was no perfect formula mm -hmm. to, to do it, um, that we know if, if it was in the vicinity, which this is, if every employee took the 10 paid sick days, which we know they won't, mm -hmm. uh, and we know that some businesses would already pay it, that that number was 150 million. So if we cut that back and went through and said, okay, let's take a percentage that has already got paid sick days, we take them out of the equation, uh, let's take uh, how many that, uh, um, that would uh, would not need them or, or, or so forth and, and other options. Like if we took that 150, the number that still come back uh, it could be half that, if, if, but these were guesstimates, like nobody could tell, and that's where I was always uncomfortable. I knew we, we needed the paid sick days, but I did never want to cr create another problem by fixing one and creating another problem, and and that's what, no answer, and I remember talking to uh, the Minister of Alberta at the time, because they were really pushing this as well, and that was the message, they, they said, we just can't figure out what, what it's going to cost. And, and I know that the federal minister in conversations I had, they wanted all the provinces to, to jump aboard, which every uh, minister at the time was in supportive of it on the conversations I had. Now, it's been a while since I, I was privy to those conversations, and a lot has happened uh, since then. So that's where I, I'm concerned. And I know a lot of the big businesses, a lot of them pay them now. Uh, this wouldn't really affect. But where my head always was 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 the small businesses, right? And we all, you look at all the rural areas and, and uh, some in your area as well that you've probably talked to on this, and that's what I could never figure out is how it would impact them and and what kind of numbers, right? And in principle, I, I support the, the bill. It's just that whole factor of what what is the actual number that's going to cost the, the business community and will that create a problem? Because the last thing we want to see happen is a small business that employs 10 people. Does this push them over the edge and have to close doors? And that's what nobody could ever tell me when I was in, in that seat. So I know you put a lot of work on it and that's where my reservation still is, is 
I don't expect you to be able to figure those numbers out because my own department couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. The federal government couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And somehow we got to find a system that's going to give us a little more of that information. And, and that's where my head's always been at. So I just uh, I wanted to share that as is that was has been my only stumbling block on, on this whole process. Can I re respond to that? Okay. Um, yes. So thank you, Minister, and I appreciate that. And uh, I agree. It is it is very hard to to come up with the perfect number to uh, articulate. You know what the costs will be. Um, I think a few things, though. You know, while we are waiting to try to figure out what that perfect number is, you know, we have workers, their health and well-being, their lives are waiting in limbo, and they're the ones who are paying the cost of this right now until we do something about it. Um, and government is not powerless here. They're not powerless at all uh, in order to be able to help those small businesses uh, that uh, will need some support. In fact, you already have the special leave fund that was put in place during COVID. That is a foundation from which to build supports that will uh, support those small businesses in this transition to permanent paid sick leave. So. Um, you know, while I, do, I agree with what you're saying, I just I want to note that you know there's a lot that government can and must and do here, um, and uh, you know we can't just wait for the perfect number to be able to do something. Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank thank you, Chair. And I guess that, that kind of goes back. I know I know that paid sick days is, is needed. There's no doubt about it, and mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody would ever question that that at all. But I want to make sure that there's jobs for, for people to go back to, right? Like, I'm not worried about the big business. The big business, a lot of them do it. And I remember when I was in uh, the, the portfolio the minister is in, a lot of businesses I talked to uh, of the biggers have already got some kind of paid sick days. There was quite a few that already had five paid sick days. And a lot of them now, especially with the workforce and the demand they're in, they, they have to be competitive with that. I'm more worried about the, the small business and, and will any be impacted to the point where some people don't have a job. And that's what nobody could ever give me the answer on. Um, and the special leave fund was designed at COVID, but this is going back to the numbers. Like from my, my recollection, we had $2 million in that special leave fund, uh, which is one thing. But if, if this mm -hmm. legislation comes in and we had to find $40, $50 $50 million, that's a far cry from the $2 million that we've been dealing with, right? And and. Like I say, going back again, it's it's just the numbers of. I'm amazed in today's world that nobody can figure this out, right? And somehow we got to find a system to be able to to figure out to what the actual number is, because um, I think this is where the business community um, they don't know in a sense either, right? And I, I know I talked to to uh, a, a small it was a coffee shop, and their business is paycheck to paycheck, like they're just getting by. Uh, we've seen what some of the, the, the holidays done in, in September and, and the loss, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't affect every business. Like I said, we have mm -hmm. companies. I, I talked to a, a gentleman that uh, owns a, a construction store, and he already, he already pays five days plus uh, bonuses mm -hmm. and, and so forth, right? So going back, I just, and there's a lot of smart people in this room. I'm just, is there any way we can try and figure out before we pass a piece of legislation or vote on a piece of, if, of what this would would cost? And and I just don't want it to create another problem. Because all of a sudden, if this, if the number is $50 million and we see businesses close their doors and employees out of work because of something that we could have prevented, and I don't think anybody's question. I'm just wondering, like, has, if anybody has any thoughts that we could never figure out of how we could kind of determine this. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to pass Thank it back. You. I'm going to Nate. You want to go ahead? Sure. Yeah. So there is actually a great uh, document called "Benefits of Paid Sick Leave During the COVID-19 Pandemic," which came up from the Ontario. Uh, science advisory table. Um, some of you might be familiar with it. The, the purpose of that table was to do research on COVID-related matters um, and to publish those publicly so that people um, you know, were aware of, of COVID-related policy and, and such. Um, so of course, one of, the, one of the, the things they looked into was paid sick leave. And I'll note something that they talk about here, because they talk about the economic impact of paid sick leave. I just want to read a quote from it. Paid sick leave can in, uh, increase productivity and reduces absenteeism <coughs> by preventing outbreaks and the chance of workplace closures. Job losses and working hour reductions during the COVID-19 pandemic have been larger in American states without a paid sick leave program. And I mean, this is all, they all have links to their, their sources and whatnot, but there's a pretty clear theme throughout it 
that when we have paid sick leave, we actually see a reduction in illness um, and we also see a reduction in absenteeism, which is good for business because if workers aren't able to go to work, that's going to hurt business. They can't make money when their workers aren't showing up. So um, it's, it's good for business in, in that aspect. And I know a, a question you were asking earlier was around how many employees do we expect are going to take this? And in particular, how is it going to impact small business? Um, I mentioned earlier that we have some challenges with data because obviously we can't necessarily get PEI data but we can get some federal data. Um, and so there is some federal data on uh, work absence of full-time employees by establishment size. Um, of course, that doesn't include part-time workers, but this might be helpful to get a sense of, of what it's like um, in different size businesses. So in Canada, um, for uh, businesses that have less than 20 employees, uh, they typically missed uh, 6.9 uh, days of work due to illness or disability in 2021. For employers that were 20 to 99 employees, it was 8.9 days of uh, due to illness or disability. For businesses that were 100 to 500 employees, it was 10.5 days uh, due to illness or disability. And for employees or employers that had 500 plus employees, uh, it was 10.7 uh, days of uh, absence due to illness or disability. And of course, part of that could be, like it's always hard to say why it's smaller in smaller businesses and why it's bigger in bigger businesses, because sometimes it could be the difference between you know, some bigger businesses having more generous leave packages. Um, sometimes it's just the nature of smaller businesses where there's less people around, there's less opportunity for illness to circulate. So, um, but I, I think that kind of gives a helpful um, idea of how it impacts businesses based on different sizes, but uh, certainly what the, the Canadian data suggests is that it's a smaller impact in, in smaller businesses right now. Uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Chair. So in question period, it was referenced about Ontario uh, in the paid sick. So I'll be honest, I know nothing about that. But has that started now? And is there any information that we could take from on Ontario of, of what this looks on the, on the business community side? Has, is it up and going now, I guess? And has there been any financial um, input that we could learn from them of, of what this looks like right now? So I don't have that information in front of me. It's certainly something to consider. Um, you know, Ontario had passed uh, three days, I believe, okay. is what they had. Um, uh, and BC has passed the five. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and the federal, as we said, federal employees uh, have access to 10 paid sick days, which is what we modeled most of our uh, bill, original bill on. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure how much of that information would translate, but we can certainly, you know, look into what, sh I, I haven't seen anything yet, have you, Nate? No, I mean, yeah, the, the way they've legislated it is that the employers have to pay out the benefit. Um, and I don't know that they still have a program that's in place to support businesses through that. And of course, the federal programs are over now, so uh, mm -hmm. employers don't have access to those benefits. So. It would be hard to say um, how it is. And I mean, someone would have to be tracking it, of course, right. in, in uh, Ontario to see what the impacts were. And I don't know that that work is happening. Minister of Social Development and Housing. So I, th I think you make some real valid points, Nate, on, I guess, the workplace production and, and so forth on, on the sick days. So I guess on that, so it, from the business community side, I'm sure they've looked at that too. So uh, what are some of the business community, like, is, when they look at that or when that was said to them, what, what's the response, right? Because I do understand that there would be, uh, like that, that makes perfect sense to me. So what's the business community's response that you've discussed and, and communicated with? What, what are they saying towards that? Sure. So, so yes. So we have uh, received feedback from uh, you know the chambers of commerce, uh, most of them on the island at different points in our consultation process, certainly. Um, uh, and I, they have expressed concern, of course. Uh, you know, as as we mentioned and as was acknowledged, uh, with the number of days and uh, you know some of the other aspects, uh, you know, of uh, of what this would mean for smaller businesses. One of the things I found, you know, I, um, I'm not, I've never been afraid of a difficult conversation, honestly. So I really appreciate whenever I get the opportunity to engage with it, with small businesses on this. Um, and I think a lot of the fear, um, you know, comes from, 
not feeling like government would actually support small business in this transition, um, which is, is it is. It's, I, I put it in the bill. It's incredibly important that we are doing that. Um, but right now, small businesses are dealing with this, right? They are experiencing, you know, workers who are coming to work sick or who, you know, are having to take time off because they're sick. Um, they're, they're facing this challenge. So actually, if we could support our small businesses to be able to provide those paid sick days and the businesses, bigger businesses that can afford it, we would actually be um, putting our small businesses at an advantage by doing that. So I think there's, there's you know, a lot to be said for uh, making sure that we're targeting our supports effectively. And there's a lot of positive that can come, particularly for our small local businesses, uh, but for all of our economy to ensure workers don't have to go to work sick. Minister of Social Development and Housing. Chair, I just got one more question. So I, I guess in the bill it says government may. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know if I've ever seen that in a bill, but I'll, yeah. I'm sure it has been before. But um, call the hour. The hour has been called. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. That was great. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Speaker, as chair of the committee, the whole house have been under consideration the bill to be intitled and act to amend the Employment Standards Act number four. I beg leave to report the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The honourable member from Morrell, Donna, Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by uh, the member from Charlottetown Windsor that this house adjourn until. November 15th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Sean Carey. Drive safe, everyone.